Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Okay, I was expecting another thing to happen. I'm just going to be totally honest. Uh, and uh, it didn't. So maybe we'll have that. Uh, let's see. Let me just start again. That was not our normal intro. We were trying to do a new intro. We don't have it, I guess. But um, welcome to the Katie Helper Show and Useful Idiots. This is a combined stream. Very excited to be here. Uh, Matt Taibbi will be joining us later on in the stream. Aaron Mate will be joining us later on in the stream. Uh, we have a bunch of great guests that are going to be joining us throughout the night. And we also have a drinking game that we can play. And uh, we are going to go over those rules right now. This is from Matt Taibbi's uh, TK Media website. So he did a drinking game for all of us out there to play. Um, and I realized that that intro did play. Okay, Brett, hold on one second, though. Let me just bring in Brad, because I got to get Brad in to explain what happened. Now, for people who watch Useful Idiots, you may not know who Brad is, but Brad's a producer at the Katie Helper Show, and he made that little video that I saw, but I didn't realize was played. Brad, why don't you come on in? Hey, Katie. Hi, Brad. How's it going? Oh, it's going good. So how did, how was that, guys? Was that great? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if people liked it. Guys, if you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Just do a thumbs up in the comments. Also, if you're watching this now, please make sure that you like this stream um, uh, because that's a great way to beat the corporate overlords. Uh, so that's cool. Well, Brad, why don't you tell people about what inspired you to make that video opening? Well, um, I didn't know it was it, oh, terrible. I totally messed that up, guys. Well, Sorry. You know, it is keeping in the Katie Helper Show tradition, though, of yeah. no no fourth wall. So true. Uh, but yeah, I guess I didn't go into it with the end result like already formed in my head. It, I guess it started out as what people would see in the thumbnail image is that animated graphic, and uh, my. Uh, what I wanted to convey there was, you know, this television set. And if you look at the TV screen, it's got this patriotic background, but it says fear in front of it. And so kind of communicating how, you know, the mainstream television broadcasts, you know, they make their business in sowing fear, uh, mm. you know, in search of clicks and views and this and that, just like we've seen now it turns out that's what Facebook and Twitter and that's their model. Like the more contentious, the more inflammatory, the more it gets elevated. Um, and then, you know, you've got that like oozing coming out of the corner of the TV and the Statue of Liberty kind of SMHing, uh, right. you know, um, and then I guess taking the text there, which was kind of in the vein of Stranger Things, I thought it would be really cool to try and recreate the Stranger Things intro, but make it the Katie Helper show. Well, intro. thank you. Thank yeah. you, Brad. That yeah. was a spooky intro. Very appropriate for both Halloween. We're off by a week. But uh, what's scarier than Halloween are the midterm elections. Yeah. So I think that that was good. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I don't know yeah. if people, oh, <laughs> I'm seeing some people saying to replay it once and then other people saying it was too long. <laughs> oh, well, all right. Maybe, maybe later on we'll, we'll replay yeah, it. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, I'm just happy to be here and I'm glad that everyone else is here. Uh, and yeah, for better or for worse, at least we're going to get through this together. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. And yeah, again, we're going to have a bunch of uh, guests joining us. So just sit tight. Um, we're going to be checking in uh, on the election results. We have a drinking game. Let's start off with that drinking game right now. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. We Caveat, have... the Katie Helper Show takes no responsibility for any alcohol poisoning true. that may yep. occur when playing very this true. game. Very, very true. All right. Well, thanks, Brad. And thanks, everyone, again, okay. for, right. for watching. Um, and thanks for that intro. So here is the uh, drinking game. Ready? And Wilson is here also. And Tyler are here. So we're going to hear from them also. Here's the drinking game. Ready? 
It is uh, called, as you can see, Violence, Democracy Itself, and Fetterman Shorts, the official 2022 midterm election. The hammer to cranium feel of congressional election propaganda will worsen exponentially tonight. Your guide to drinking the pain away. So we're going to just scroll down. Okay, let's scroll down to the actual drinking rules. Okay. So uh, according to these rules, let's read there. Uh, Drink every time anyone from a candidate to a TV anchor mentions that democracy is on the ballot. Double shot for use of the phrase democracy itself, e.g. democracy itself is on the ballot. Drink every time you're told this is the most important election of our lifetime or the most critical moment of our lives, etc. You may drink an, an additional shot if you're certain today is not any of those things. Uh, Drink every time Steve Kornacki draws a frenzy geometric shape around Pennsylvania. Drink every time John Fetterman's shorts are visible in a video report. Drink every time Nate Silver reminds you he doesn't do predictions, but rather publishes percentage chance forecasts. Drink every time Liz Cheney is mentioned, i.e. as if mattering. Drink every time Elon Musk is blamed for something. Double shot at the bad thing is, quote, in the name of or under the guise of free speech. Drink anytime anyone mentions over 100 election deniers on the ballot. Also drink for permutations on the theme, e.g. 60% of Americans will have an election denier on the ballot, or over half of GOP candidates are election deniers. Election denier J.D. Vance wants to to ban books, etc. Anyone mentions the specter of violence or conditions right for violence or reports votes are being counted amid threats of violence, do an exclamation shot at the end of the night if no violence is ultimately observed. Drink any time a politician or a pundit warns that everything might come down to the wild card in Georgia. And with suspicious gleefulness reminds you, we might all be waiting until December 6th to find out who will control the Senate. Call it the no sleep till Georgia rule. All right. So those are all the rules for now. Later on, I'll I'll tune in for the specific MSNBC rules, but we'll get to those later. So I'm going to, now that we know the drinking rules, we'll be checking in on the news coverage later throughout the night. Um, and we're going to bring in our first guest. I'm so excited. She's making her debut on the Katie Halper show. Uh, you may have seen her, uh, on lots of different programs, including on the breakfast club. Very exciting moment. Uh, and I'm speaking of none other than movement lawyer, Olami Oluren. Hey, Eliamy, Eliamy, Eliamy. Sorry, uh, Eliamy. I got, I got, you got, you Eliamy, got right? I got like nervous. Yes. I got uh, performance anxiety. Eliamy, welcome. Oh, hey, boo. How, how are you? Thanks so much for coming. Good, good. I'm good. So, not only are you a a lawyer, but you are also, I think, a TikTok star. Is that fair to say? TikTok, but my, my face be places videos, certain yeah. socials. But yeah. how do you make those really good videos you make? Are those on TikTok? They're everywhere. I, honestly, they just they're my rants. They're my regular. <laughs> they're, and you do them just regular. onto your camera? Like do you post Yeah, them? like literally standard on my phone. Like wow. the, the way y'all get them straight from me, like, oh rant. <laughs> they're <laughs> really good. Them. And then do you do the the subtitles on uh, any particular program automatically instagram will like automatic oh, you just click okay. captions and it automates them wow all right so it's yes. not i i thought it, it had a snap i thought it was um a tiktok look to it but it could you be know, you thought it was exceptionally talented but yeah no, yeah but... oh well no. you are exceptionally talented but not but but i thought you were exceptionally talented on another level in another yes, area no. <laughs> okay no. well Thank you so much for coming. And you're someone who covers a lot of uh, important issues, especially crime, copaganda, uh, and you debunk a lot of myths that are oh, spouted out by not just Republicans, because that's obvious. We know Republicans are do a lot of dog whistling, or sometimes it's not dog whistling, it's just overt. But sadly, the Democrats play at this game too. So can you just like explain to people what copaganda is, how people can recognize it, and what uh, realities are being covered up by this copaganda? Yeah. Well, copaganda is basically the way that, like, mass incarceration, policing the criminal system, this idea that, like, the police, uh, the system is about justice, the prosecutors are all the good guys, and other people that find themselves in the system are bad. Um, and it's not just in that. We get we get fed that in media, right? We get in our regular mainstream, just journalism coverage, right? They take police narratives as absolute fact. They present that as, as absolutes. And they just... Um, 
they, they, they perpetuate that bias to us as, as fact and objectivity. But beyond that, right, beyond just the fact that we're uh, filled with like law and order, snapped, just, I mean, the whole true crime genre, just every cop show, Lucifer, it, it's in everything. But it's also in other things, like little things that people don't even think of. It's in the Powerpuff Girls, it's in Darkwing Duck, it's in all these little like, and that's the way. To me, those are more concerning than... Like Law and Order, at least to some degree, you know. Once I've right. told you what propaganda is, you think, okay, Law and Order, you know those things qualify. But you're not going to think about it like, ooh, Darkwing Duck, why is Bushwick the villain? You know, certain right. things like that. So it's that way. It's the way that constantly throughout our media and our everyday life, we're constantly being programmed and um, basically uh, indoctrinated into believing uh, that our system our system is the only way, one, that that's the only way justice and the criminal system are synonymous, but two, that the people who find themselves in there are villains. Right. And something that a lot of commentators are saying is that Democrats, if they lose, or one of the reasons they're going to lose is because they are running on defunding the police, which I didn't know they were running on that. So what, how do you respond to that allegation? They're liars. I mean, they're just liars. They're liars. They're shameless liars. They're liars. Where where are they? Can you find me exactly who is running on the defund the police platform? Like this is this is the thing that I find interesting, right? Like I've noticed this, and I'm not gonna call their names, but a lot of these uh, 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 commentators that alleged to be on our side that have taken this uh, this flagship of running uh, propaganda and all this like right wing nonsense about crime, they keep being like, oh, the rest of us are gaslighting them, are like lying about oh, there's a crime wave. Here's my thing. Let's forget forget the fact that there isn't this massive crime wave. Forget that. Let's pretend. Let's pretend that's the case. I'm gonna give you that. Sure. Okay. What we're currently doing is what you, mass incarceration. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're doing mass incarceration. We're doing that. Like we have the police have not been defunded anywhere. All of the places that they're mainly highlighting, um, that they're mainly highlighting, um. As the so sorry, I was getting a call and it just zoomed me out. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. But I'm fine. It's good. It. It's dramatic. Um, it's, it's showing how important yeah. this is. Yeah. But all the places that they're mainly highlighting, like New York City, Chicago, LA, all these places that they're painting out like Gotham City, right? All these like areas with all the crime. We give more money to the police than anybody. Everything, like, okay, let's say it's true. Let's say New York City is Gotham City. We have a massive crime with the Democrats in power and they have given more money to policing more money to mass incarceration so what's your problem how what is the issue here you you say we're supposed to vote republican so republicans can do what the same thing that according to you crime is still increasing i'm living for this zoom dramatic effect this is i know it's great oh, oh i love it I'm, I'm here for it so yeah that's that's what i would say to them they're liars they're yeah. liars and they also don't make no sense because they're basically advocating. That's my thing. The only method we're doing right now, the only thing I have never had my political dreams become law. Not a, one of my political dreams are law policy. So if things ain't going right, they're not going right under y'all's current status quo. So that is not an argument for us to keep doing more of the same. That is not an argument against Democrats, unfortunately, for them. That's how I feel. Yeah. Do you want to try to show you want to? Uh leave and come back in so you're i mean i like the dramatic effect but we may want for editing purposes the, oh yes yeah um yeah we, we i don't know hold on let me see if it does sure. this hold on oh no that didn't work yeah, i'll even come back all right i'll even come back one right. second sure this is because this is too good a conversation to although i do like the dramatic up uh, personal and by the way everyone please like this stream everyone also become a uh patreon supporter at patreon.com slash the katie helper show or you can come support, become supporters of you, uh, useful idiots at uh, at usefulidiots.substack.com. And again, this is a show where we're having lots of guests. So we're having Olaomi on now. Then we're going to have on uh, Ross Barkin. Then we're going to have on Leslie Lee. Then we're going to have on Marianne Williamson. Then we're going to have on Matt Taibbi and Aaron Mate and maybe someone else. Um, I can't confirm that yet. But right now, I'm very excited because we have this a crime expert. And this is one of the biggest things that keeps getting talked about in these elections. And it kind of drives me crazy because, as Olaimi was just pointing out, mass incarceration is the system. It's what's happening now. The police have not been defunded and no one's really running on that. So uh, why, why do you think it is, though, that Democrats are not framing their uh, reality on their own? Why are they just reacting to these talking points coming from the right? Um, because that's what they do in general. That's what that's all they do in general. All they ever do is respond. That is the problem with why we constantly lose. Just as a just as a point of strategy, the minute you let the other person frame the entire narrative, you've lost. The minute you let them frame it and you're responding, you've lost. It's just that simple. And Democrats do that with 
everything. Like I believe Republicans practice and successfully, they successfully practice a politics of distraction. They're just constantly throwing bones at us. And every time Dems go running instead of actually doing that. And I also think there's a level of Democrats just always being scared about what is the natural, natural response. Like you're in an adversarial system. Those are your opponents. They're always going to make a move and you have to make a move back. But instead what Democrats do is every time Republicans do something or maybe might do something is all this fear and panic. I don't understand why the logical response has not been for like, for example, take New York City. Hochul and Zeldin should not be, they shouldn't be close, let alone as close as they are. But yet, they are, because instead of Hochul and them this entire time, they've let Eric Adams. And this is the governor, just for people who know, uh, aren't locals, this is the governor's race that we're talking about in the New York governor's State. Yeah. Race. Let, me, let me give you back. So the governor's race in New York City right now, our, our governor is Hochul, who had come in after, you know, the Cornwall scandal. Right. She's a dumb. Zeldin is a right-wing extremist. Um, and normally, <laughs> our very blue New York City, right. it's not close. Normally, it's supposed to be firmly blue. But unfortunately, we've had, you know, a uh, fair mongering cop, Eric Adams, just all year, just every day. Like, that's the thing. And I, and I don't want to say I told them so, but I did tell them so. It might be a problem if every day your mayor is every day suggesting that y'all are failures. He's hyping. He is literally fair mongering about crime all day. He's creating all this hysteria, 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 hysteria. And then he's essentially telling y'all, that y'all are failing, and Democrats are in every office, so who do you think is going to fall back on? But instead of getting it together and maybe not rallying behind this cop in the first place, they'll be stuck with him. No! Right. Eric Adams, Adams was, was a cop, everyone, in case you didn't know yep. that. Yeah. Yep. And they was just rolling him out, like, oh, this messaging expert, Pelosi, them had him at the DNC conventions and stuff, and now look. And now look. And now, now you're shocked. Now you're shocked that a, a candidate could come in and take, like, it's not like, it's important to remember Zeldin is not a genius. He didn't come up with these talking points, all right? These right. talking points were fed, were fed. This is literally the campaign that Eric Adams has been on all year. All he did was he's literally invoked Eric Adams himself. So, of course, the people are going to think, you know what I mean? You're going to see, you're going to see uh, support mobilized around that. But honestly, it's basically just Democrats being uh, afraid and always letting Republicans lead. Hmm. And what about this talking point? You, you hear people talking all the time about, Oh, look at this no cash uh, ending bail. This is uh, this person just came out and killed someone because of the bail reform. Can you cut, shed some uh, clarity uh, yeah. in that area? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Again, more just more propaganda, more baseless cap propaganda. First of all, New York City still has a cash bail system. I, I want to make sure that's known. New York City very much so still has cash bail. What happened with bail reform at the top of 2020, which was a move to decarcerate Rikers and get us um, towards, you know, bail reform and also getting us towards the vision of closing Rikers because that's a human rights crisis. Um, but bail reform made certain misdemeanors, misdemeanors and nonviolent crimes, nonviolent felonies, nonviolent crime, uh, non-bail eligible. However, for everything else, violent crime, assault, murder, all these other things people are talking about, cash bail not only can and will be set on, but statistics have showed that the introduction of, of bail reform has actually led them to set bail higher on those charges. Second of all, on any case, this has always been the case and it will always be the case. If you are out on bail for anything in New York and you're rearrested or you violate the terms of your release, bail will be set on you. You will be remanded. That's just absolutely factual. So that's this whole myth, this whole idea that these people are out here just committing crime and they're just getting a free, it literally does not work like that. If you violate the terms of your release, you are going, you're going to jail. More importantly, the whole purpose of bail is to ensure that people return to court. Prior to bail reform, about 15, uh, about 15 percent of people didn't return to court. After bail reform, about nine percent. So actually, bail reform has been incredibly successful. Then, as far as all these people fear mongering about violence and people recommend violence, so the uh, the Brennan Center did a study and they studied over 100,000 uh, cases between 2020 to 2021, and only less than two percent of people were rearrested for felonies or violent crime. So. Then on top of that, most cases in New York State, let alone New York City, over 80% of cases that are charged as felonies are resolved with a non-criminal conviction altogether. So it's just a myth. It's just a myth. Right. And what about the, the stories about rates of crime? Which, which ones? The uh, crime rate that, going up? Yeah. Uh, first of all, so they actually, studies are actually just dropped on this yesterday, a beautiful chart. Um, actually, I wish I had had to link. But not only is the, the crime rate up marginally, despite the fact what is up is crime coverage. Crime coverage is up. Crime is not what's drastically up. Crime coverage is up. But more importantly, even if it is, 
that still is not an argument for that is not an argument in favor of continuing to do the same things that we've been doing because that's what we're currently doing and also uh requires us to interrogate why crime would be up if crime is up in new york city in 2022 it might have something to do with the fact that in 20 first of all new york, new york city is one of the most expensive places to live in the world our current rent has gone up to an average of four thousand dollars yet the minimum wage is what fifteen dollars you lose forty percent of your income in taxes this is an astronomically expensive place to live in and so if you see crime it's because you see poverty and that is just true that's not that's not a talking point i would like right. the the vast majority of the people in the criminal system are poor are literally living underneath the poverty line but specifically in new york city almost everybody is represented by a public defender and that means you have little to no income so it would have something to do with the fact that new york city was locked down in a pandemic businesses closed down we had a, we had an eviction moratorium for months because people could not pay their rent now imagine what new york city rent is thousands of dollars uh, uh, racking up after months and months and months and months, and then they just up and lifted the eviction moratoriums. So tons of people end up homeless, end up homeless with nowhere to go. Yeah, that's why. That's why crime would be up because people are poor. Mm. And how does just for? I mean, I think a lot of people know this, but some people, I think it's worth for breaking it down. And you, I've heard you do this, but why does poverty create? Not, not. I don't want to. I don't. I want to be careful. It's not like poor people. It's not like. I'm not, this is not about individuals, but why does lack of resources, why does that create uh, more crime than, um, yeah, why does that create crime? Why, in other words, why are people, sorry, everyone, I have a cold, so I'm a little bit, my head is a little bit like distracted right now. So I apologize for that. But why do people, people who are, are hard on crime or tough on crime or people who want to get rid of crime often don't understand that the things that they're advocating for, which is like mass incarceration or more cops um, or austerity actually creates a lot more crime. Yeah. That's what, my thing is this, right? And in life, in life, if we want to stop anything, if we want to, we, we want to stop or start any type of behavior we want, we, we have to examine it. That's always it. That why is this, why is this happening? Right. Why is this happening? Because that's how we would get something, something to stop. And the same thing, obviously is what we need to do for crime, but people are reluctant to do it. And it's because we have created an entire large profit system. One, we've, been, we've created an entire profit system around this criminal system, but two, this criminal system specifically uh, polices certain certain populations that the larger powers that be want to see police. And that's just the truth of it. Because the reality is we know this. If you were the same under the the most, the safest communities are not the most police communities. They are the most resource communities. We know this. All of the areas that they call high crime areas are the most under-resourced communities that have continued to be that way generation after generation after generation. Because of course, if you saddle people, you're taking the poorest populations and you're saddling them with criminal convictions and all of the fines, rap sheets, collateral consequences of not being able to get a job, not being able to get housing. All of those things follow them for literally the rest of their lives. And thus also all of the children that they produce, the neighborhoods that they produce, the communities. So you are literally guaranteeing that a community exists in poverty. And I mean, as far as why it would lead to crime, because if you don't, and, and it's not just, I want to say this about crimes and poverty. People like to think of crimes and poverty like, oh, they stole something. Um, you know, they, they can understand, oh, they stole food or they stole, you know, a thing, how that's a crime of poverty, but they don't see that for like everything else, assault, mental, anything else that comes out of it. But it's like, if you don't have money, if you don't have the resources to deal with anything in your life, how do you think that impacts how you start to think, how you start to feel, how you start to react and everything else conditionally that you're dealing with? If nobody has, you know how many clients I have like where a mother has been trying to get mental health resources for a child literally since he was born and can't, you know what I mean? A lifetime, a lifetime of doing that and not being able to, you can't get educated. You, you, you can't get proper education. You can't get proper housing. You can't buy proper things. That affects how you respond to life situations and life's actors. You're, you're essentially, another thing we have to remember too when we judge, when we don't look at violence and these different types of things, we look at them as divorced from poverty and divorced uh, from crime, but it's not. You were literally, we're, we're, we're putting people in environments where they have nothing and forcing them to fend for themselves and to fight one another and to fight over the scarce amount of resources. That, that breeds violence. And then what do you do? You criminalize them and you incarcerate them where they have to, again, fight for their lives. That, again, breeds and indoctrinates violence. And then when they get out, you send them right back into the same under-resourced communities that are already fighting for their lives with that exact, with everything that they've learned to demonstrate what they learned in prison. It's just a, a vicious cycle. So that's why. And so, and what are some of the ways that uh, these problems can be solved? If it's not through incarceration, obviously, or increased police presence, what are the things that we know from research actually lower crime? The, the, the root causes, giving people 
giving people money for education, giving people money for housing, giving people health money for health care and mental health resources, giving people the money to take care of themselves. And that's something that we know and we understand in, ev in every single other context, right? We know that people need the means, need the means to take care of themselves because, and that's, and also, and I think this would tie us to a larger point is listen to those people. The communities are tell, tell people what they need. They tell they are literally asking for, asking for resources, asking to be heard, asking to have the police taken out of their communities. It's, you know, whenever they talk about it, it's so interesting. All these different commentators and, and politicians love to use Black people as a prop and use victims of crime as a prop to, to, to argue in favor of mass incarceration. And they love to be like, oh, Black people, crime is the, the top thing Black people are thinking about. Thinking about crime, everyone is thinking about their safety. Everybody, that's not a secret. That's not a myth. Everybody, black people, everyone thinks about crime. That does not mean that we have the same response to how we should deal with it. And black people, statistically, victims, advocates are the people that are in favor of criminal justice reform and are telling you, hey, mass incarceration is not helping my community. Policing is not helping my community. Police brutality is not helping my community. So I also think we have to call out these people that continue to, to they end a conversation short. It's just the, the lack of the incomplete rule. Like in court, you, you wouldn't be able to, I can't just insert like an excerpt of our conversation and leave out the rest. Right. That's what they love to do. They love to use black people. Black people care about crime. Yeah, yeah. We're also, if we're, you know what I think is interesting? If black people are, the way these people present it, like black people are the, um, the sole uh, uh, perpetrators of crime, right? So if we're the sole perpetrators of crime within our own communities, right? That's what they say. Our neighborhoods are the high crime areas, the dangerous areas. So we're also the sole victims. We're the victims, right? We're both the perpetrators and the victims of crime. So then how come if we are telling you, we are the ones telling you we are the most, we have the highest police presence, we are most impacted by this criminal system, and we are telling you it's not helping us. It's not helpful. It's harmful. We do not feel safe. We do, this is not doing anything to help us. And you know that because you know that. It's literally generation after generation after generation. That's a problem. And what do you, kind of work uh, do you do right now as a lawyer? As, as a public defender or just yeah. in general as a movement lawyer? Both. Uh, as a public defender, I represent um, poor, poor anybody, anybody that does that cannot afford a representation that is arrested and accused of a crime in New York City. I represent you and handle uh, your entire criminal case. And outside of that, as a movement lawyer, I am constantly working with other other or like organizations, activists on the ground, whoever, um, to help support them and bring attention to whatever it is that they're fighting and how we can get them the resources is a constant thing. Yeah. How do you, is it frustrating? I mean, how do you stay in it? Do you ever want to quit because of uh, no 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 as uh, as far as just the the general work as being like as a public defender that's a separate question but yeah, as, as that's uh, what I was thinking about general, as a public defender honestly oh uh, child um yeah so that's a longer that's a yeah, longer we'll, a longer yeah, answer yeah. but as far as overall um when it comes to the liberation of black people no i never i never because this is what i would this is what i would do like this is my natural my natural self everything that i say and i advocate for that's what i would be doing all day every day regardless i just so i feel these are the things that um uh plague my mind most in the world and it's because it's it's reality i think that's something i like when i came to america i came to america because i wanted to be a lawyer but what made me um developed a particular interest in wanting to fight for black people is because I couldn't look away. It was literally forced. It wasn't like this. I'm from a black majority country. So I saw it so clearly how racist this mm. country is it was, because it was, it was new. Like what is going on here? This is the wildest experience. And it took me years and years of trying to figure it out. And then like, like just trying to conceptualize what was happening because I had no warning. Like my parents, my parents, like my family still lives in the Bahamas. I came here alone and I was a teenager and no one told me nothing. I didn't have it. So I'm like, what is going on? And I'm in West Virginia. So it took me a while. Wow. To, yeah, exactly. So then I went to college in Ohio and I started reading like, oh, wait a minute. I started learning. I started studying and I realized like, oh, and I just, I, I can't, I can't not do it. So for me, it's just, and I just look at it as, I look at it as a privilege. I think it's a privilege to be a, Every like black people don't get to opt in to you know how you feel about what's happening with the black community or being emotionally invested in that. We don't. You just have to spend your every day, your all day, you're black, and that's exhausting. But I have the privilege of being able to go, hey, you know what? My, my career is this. I'm gonna argue yeah. for this. It's safe. Like the things that I say and I advocate for and stuff. There are all kinds of countless black people that have been killed, or are political prisoners, or war political. The stakes. The stakes are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Really high. I'm, I'm in a position of privilege. So honestly, no, I never want to quit. I feel. Blessed, blessed and highly favored. Great. Awesome. Uh, okay, last thing. If you were working for the Democrats, how would you tell them to deal with crime? How, how would you tell them to talk about it? I would tell 
I would like if you were working for, for Hokal or whatever, what would you tell her to her talking points to I, me? I would have told Hokal from law. First of all, she should have started ages ago. She should have, she should have started ages ago. But she should have she should have uh, exposed. She should have backed all of the, the the studies and the research that was coming out. You know, debunking all these things. And then she should have probably should have got Eric Adams on the same page. But I think they should have come out and said, "Hey, actually, this is what it is." This is what it is, and this is how we've been addressing it. And I also think that I think the Democrats would be benefited benefited a lot from ha- even having the appearance of community input. Like I think in a world where Hochul had been had come out, like talked to the people, really campaigned on, like, okay, this is what it actually is. This is what y'all are saying. What do y'all think? How do we respond? Some level of that, but it was her her campaigning approach seemed to be very hidden. Like I'm just gonna hide and then and like avoid this thing till the ninth hour. But I would have just come up and addressed it directly. Hey. We were in this pandemic. This is happening. People are a crime is what we're talking about. But these are the actual numbers. This is what's happening. And this is what we've been doing about it. And what is the community input? I think people would have responded better to that. But if you allow the other side to put out a narrative and you never address or debunk it, and then you just wait till the ninth hour to act like, and you still don't debunk it. You just act like you're going to, you're going to just do crime better, you know? Right. So I would have, I would have been honest. Honesty would have been my approach. Mm. Too bad. It's a little late. Maybe next time. Next yeah, time. I don't work for him. Anything else you want to share? No, no. Y'all follow me on socials at Miss Olurin, M-S-O-L-U-R-I-N. And I have a sub stock called Alurinati that I publish essays on monthly. And I suggest you subscribe. Yeah, it's great. It's a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Katie. Bye. Have a great night. That was great. Okay, allow me. That was amazing. She's such a great speaker. And I'll link to her. Uh, you got to check out her 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 videos that she puts on Instagram and on Twitter. They're very good. Uh, and they're pretty funny. She manages to make funny videos about, uh, about things that are very serious. So moving on guys, like the stream. If you haven't already liked it, make sure you like it and hi people who are watching at the Katie Halper show and hi people who are watching at useful idiots. And again, Aaron and Matt will be in the stream later tonight. Um, but we are going to bring in our next guest. Very excited. He's been on the show before. He's joining us from a Kathy Hochul party that, again, is the current um, uh, governor of New York, the Democrat, who is make, facing a much uh, harder challenge than she had uh, anticipated from Lee Zeldin, who um, we were just talking about, who's a right winger, a, Trump, a Trumpian Republican. So we are going to talk to Ross Barkin, who is a journalist and also a novelist. And uh, let's see. Uh, tell us what's happening, Ross. Are you there? Yes. Can, can great. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm sitting at the Kathy Hochul party right now. Um, it is close to polls closing in New York. Uh, they close at 9 p.m. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand actually is here speaking to press. I, I see her off to my right. Um, you know, people here are obviously very excited. It's in um, Chinatown in Manhattan. It's at this uh, very lavish-looking uh, former... Uh, savings bank that's now like this grandiose, uh, I guess, catering hall or something like that. So, you know, it's very interesting. I I, I still think Kathy Hochul will find a way to win this race. Just the, the math remains with her. New York is such a democratic state, but undoubtedly the energies with Lee Zeldin with Republicans right now, I do think down the ballot is going to be a big challenge for Democrats in New York. A lot of swing races in the state. And I would imagine Democrats are going to lose a lot of them uh, in the House, especially. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, again, these are we'll know very soon. Um, this is just my sense as of right now that, you know, Hochul will slog her way uh, to victory with a very kind of uninspiring campaign. And, and Democrats uh, otherwise are going to have a hard night. And why is it that Zeldin has so much energy behind him? So I think some of it is just the midterm dynamic, which, you know, I think it is boring to say, but that's the reality that we're in a political system where there is always a backlash against the party in power. It happened to George Bush, happened to Obama, it happened to Trump, it's happened to Biden, right? I also think, you know, there there is a, a sense that Zeldin is tapping into the zeitgeist at the moment, which is this fear of crime, which, you know, it's real. Uh, you, you can't just hand wave it away. There are a lot of people who are both affluent and working class who are worried about crime. And Zeldin has been talking about it nonstop. He definitely has gotten a lot of traction with that. He's going to get Democratic crossover votes. There's certainly concerns about inflation as well. 
but my sense here in the final days and weeks, the messaging has really been around crime, and Hochul is, is on the defensive. And, you know, I, I think part of her issue is she didn't spend enough time in very democratic parts of the state, particularly New York City. We'll see what turnout looks like. She may have gotten enough Democrats to come out in the end. But I do think for a long time she took the race for granted. Zeldin did not. I mean, Zeldin's a Trump Republican, but he was very good at um, making himself appear more moderate than he is and really uh, taking the focus off of Trump and just campaigning a lot. He was in New York City a lot. And that may pay dividends. You know, we'll see. Uh, But certainly, if you're you're going off vibes, the vibes are with Zeldin. I think if you're going off polls and, and data, you, you, it, it's very hard to pick against Hochul, but but no doubt, like the feeling is not with her right now. But feelings don't always win elections. Right. Um, you wrote a piece at your Substack about attending some literary magazine parties and then <laughs> attending some political rallies, and you said that the rallies were less attended, was one exception, than the literary uh, parties. So can you uh, compare these two uh, uh, types of yeah, parties? Yeah, I mean, at? it's you know, <laughs> look. Post pandemic, man, the literary scene's getting hot again in New York, and that's great. These new magazines are really, you know, drawing people like many hundreds of people who, who, who probably maybe even a thousand people. I don't know. I'm not good at counting crowds, but it was very crowded. And, you know, the, the Hoka rally with Chad with Biden at Sarah Lawrence College was like very well attended. You know, they had it on a big lawn, people came. She did, a, she did a rally with Hillary and Kamala Harris at Barnard College, which apparently hit their capacity, but it was like a pretty small auditorium. And just to me was underwhelming when you consider this is the governor of New York, this is Hillary Clinton, who is a celebrity regardless, and the vice president of the United States, right? And the Bill Clinton rally was really, uh, you know, I don't know who it was who it was for, quite frankly, because in this like very strange, out of the way studio space in downtown Brooklyn where regular people like weren't notified about it, and it was just a bunch of like members of organized labor in like a little pen uh, cheering for her. And yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, again, the energy is not there with her. People are not excited about her. She didn't really offer any affirmative vision for what she wants to do in the next four years. Like, I don't think she's a bad governor of any means. She's only been governor for a year, a little bit since taking over for Cuomo. But there's just not really like a public argument. You know, she didn't really run any, any big policies. She talked about abortion for a while. But as we know, you can't only do that and then hope to coast. Um, there, there's just no finely tuned message. And I, I think she's, she's paying a price for that. You know, people are not excited to vote for her. They will because they don't like Zeldin. Um, but, but you, you just see there, there's this lackadaisical kind of listless nature to all of it and to our events as well. Um, now again, I, I do think she'll win, but it was just an interesting contrast. I, I, by coincidence, went to these parties and then went to these rallies at almost the same time. It's like, wow, I mean, I can see where people are genuinely more excited and it wasn't at the uh, vocal events. Yeah. And what other races are you keeping an eye on? So um, I'm looking at certainly the house races. Uh, there, there's a lot of competitive races. You know, I think progressives will, will feel a little shout in Freuda if Sean Patrick Maloney loses in the Hudson Valley, you know, I, I you know, he was like a, a Cuomo shill and you know, very hostile to like the left wing of the party, and he's the head of the DCCC. There's like a good chance he's going to lose his um, election. You know, Long Island has four competitive races. I think there's a chance for Republicans win all of them. Um, you have in in the Hudson Valley and Syracuse area. Um, you know, Pat Ryan, who won in August, really running on abortion rights. He is in a tough race. Um, Mark Molinaro, a Republican who once ran against Cuomo, he might go to Congress. And then, you know, Syracuse area as well, where John Katko, who is sort of a moderate Republican, he's retiring. And that's kind of a toss up, but could go the Republicans' way. So, I mean, New York, because of the way redistricting went, which is a long story, has like a lot of now uh, toss up districts. And this is like not a good year for Democrats to have a lot of toss up districts. So, I imagine they will lose the lion's share of those districts. Um, but, you know, we shall see. As I said, polls close very soon. Right. Um, what about, uh, you, you focus a lot on DSA. Uh, what, uh, what What are they doing this election? Yeah, so it's funny. I, I think, like, progressives and, and, and leftists and, and DSA elected officials are doing more for local than, honestly, like, the state party is. Like, I mean, they're doing it under 
the push to vote for, for WFP. So the Working Families Party in New York now has to win ballot status every two years, thanks to Cuomo, another long story. And so they need a certain number of votes on their line to, to basically stay a political party. So a lot of DSA and a lot of leftists are saying, you know, vote vocal on WFP to keep the WFP around. Yeah, I've written critically WFP, you know, they and DSA have a good relationship. It's not a perfect one, but I think a lot of socialists in the state see it as kind of a, a worthy ally and vehicle to have around. So, you know, to the credit, I've well, it depends on your view, I would say. But, you know, a, a lot of the DSA electeds are trying to pull votes out for Hochul. You know, I, I think under the correct argument that you can get socialist policy out of Hochul, if Zeldin is governor, it's all done. Like, there, there's no chance you're getting any stronger tenant protections. You're getting nothing on climate change. The whole DSA agenda in Albany, which has actually had real success, you know, even you know, criminal justice reforms, it is all DOA under Republican governor, whereas hopefully, you know, she's going to not be, uh, you know, an overly powerful figure. She's someone you can pressure. She is a moderate, but, uh, you know, she is someone who, in theory, you can uh, work with or, or at least um, push in the direction you want her to push in. Whereas, I mean, Zeldin's a Republican. Zeldin's a Trump guy. I mean, Zeldin will probably be go- governing for Fox News. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to really want to govern in a way where like a Charlie Baker or Larry Hogan will govern where they just really want to run a blue state and, and, and do their best. My sense is he's ambitious. He wants to probably be president. And if he's governor of New York, everything he does is going to be probably about the national spotlight. And that means no leftist uh, legislation is is getting past his desk. He'll veto it. And they probably won't have the numbers for a veto override. So I think DSA rightly sees this as an important election because to have a state agenda, you have to have Kathy Hochul in there. Uh, Zeldin, it's finished. What are the types of things for the cynics out there, including myself a little bit, but what are the types of things that uh, DSA was able to get through uh, Hochul, with Hochul or Cuomo? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, so uh, funnily enough, a lot of the big progressive accomplishments came when DSA had less members, which was in 2019, where a lot of progressive Democrats won and Julia Salazar won. Um, and Cuomo was kind of on the defensive. They got the partial end of cash bail, which is a very, very big deal, which helped. Zeldin is now dragging Democrats around, but, you know, is a very important criminal justice reform. Um, you got stuff on climate change, you know, really important legislation, um, you know, that I think will pay dividends in the long term. Strengthening tenant protections, very big deal. I mean, it's a little wonky, but the um, ending the ability of landlords to take apartments out of the rent stabilization system, you know, that really did matter. Um, I, I think on the housing side, um, you know, progressives and leftists have made progress in Albany where they did not for a very long time. And now the block of DSA members is growing. It's still small. I mean, next year, DSA is going to have three state senators in a body of 63, and they'll have uh, five or maybe six state assembly members. So it's not a lot, but it's more than zero or one. So it's easy to be cynical, but I do think they have a real strategy because to get policy done and make change, you have to do it through the state legislature in New York. And what we've seen in the past is if you do work as a block, you can pressure other Democrats to kind of do the things you want to do. So, um, you know, I think there are victories they can win next year with Hochul there. Zeldin, you win nothing. Mm-hmm. How does uh, Hochul compare to Cuomo? I think in some ways she's similar in that, you know, she, she's not at all progressive. I think her, her, she fundraises from the very same people, you know, she fundraises from wall street, from the real estate industry. Um, her instincts are not with the left at all. I think the difference is she's not vindictive. She doesn't have like these sort of quasi psychopathic tendencies and she's someone that you can negotiate with. I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, the first budget was a mixed bag for the left. You know, she, she's, screwed them on uh she did partially repeal some of those uh bail reforms she got the huge tax break for the bill stadium which was like a terrible economic development policy she did plow a lot of money into public education which was a big deal which was something progressives wanted for a long time um you know i think unlike cuomo she's not going to play games with the public university system that was something cuomo for years like i went to a suny sunys and cunies like it felt like every budget cycle were fighting for their lives with a Cuomo administration that like, you know, on a whim would just pull funding and then restore it. And then you had to have like marches and protests and it was just a huge mess. So again, like I see 
Kokel is a conventional moderate. She, she's nothing for the left to celebrate by any means. But I think because she's more conventional, she's someone that can be worked with or worked against. Whereas with Cuomo, I mean, you know, I think the only time progressives got anything from Cuomo was when he was probably in 2019 thinking of running for president and was on the defensive a bit when Democrats retook the state Senate. But I think beyond that, he was just such a active enemy of the left. I don't think Hochul is an active enemy of the left. I think she is not an ally, but Cuomo would actively find ways, it's felt like every year, to undermine uh, progressives um, and, and socialists in, in New York State. Yeah, it, uh, of course, people may not know about this, but uh, Cuomo, in addition to having uh, a lot of blood on his hands, and I think, in my opinion, because of the way he uh, dealt with uh, COVID yes. and gave, of course, uh, immunity to uh, nursing homes and hospitals when it came to uh, negligence, something that uh, David Sirota has written a lot about and Ron Kim has talked a lot about. Uh, when Ron Kim, when, when Cuomo's... Uh, a uh, aide basically confessed that they had cooked the books and distorted the numbers on the deaths. Uh, Ron yes. Kim, apparently, who is an assemblyman, uh, was going to speak out about it publicly, and Cuomo called him and threatened to destroy him. So yes. that's just a, yeah, which you know because, of course, you wrote a book called The Prince about <laughs> Cuomo. So you know his. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Hochul is just not going to do that. You know, Hochul is right. not calling up state assembly members and threatening them. Now, of course, I think there's an argument to make, you know, style, you know, it yeah. should be style over substance. And, and I think the substance, the jury is out. But again, she's only been governor for a year. I think next year, assuming she wins, will be very interesting. I, I think she's going to feel uh, cross current pressures on the left and the right. You know, the right is going to pressure her because Republicans are going to do well tonight. And I think the left is going to pressure her because, like, you know, we're the only ones trying to even pull a vote out for you, like, realistically. Um, but she's got to win first, right? Polls close uh, eight minutes. And, again, I hesitate to back off my view that she'll find a way to win. But I'll tell you what, you're out there. You, you feel, like, viscerally Zeldin's momentum and just the number of people who are, like, openly excited. And the way they're openly excited about Trump you know, I, I liken my substack to Trump v. Hillary Clinton. There yeah. are a lot of similar vibes to that election where people were not excited about Hillary. They were excited about Trump. I think the ultimate difference is that the lack of an electoral college and that Zeldin's got to find a way to 50%. Trump never did. And so I think that'll bail her out. But again, I do get some of those, you know, 2016 was the first presidential campaign I ever covered. And there are there are vibes. I'll tell you what the the the, the low key rallies, the the pulling up, pulling in the uh, faded stars of the party, right? Um, you know the kind of hectoring people uh, to vote. Uh, it, it it does bring back a lot of memories. Whether that means it'll end that way uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite uh, Zeldin moments was when he uh, asked. Ilan Omar to condemn some anti-Semitic <laughs> messages that someone left on his machine uh, as if she was behind them or had anything to do with them. Yeah, I mean, I think in a way, Hochul is lucky that Zelda is still a MAGA guy at the end of the day. You know, I, I think that's a saving grace for her because if you are not a MAGA Republican and there are non-MAGA Republicans, uh, some right. who are in New York, kind of just like regular moderates or just, you know, very, you know, pro Wall Street and and tough on crime, but aren't like pro Trump really, and are sort of acceptable to like middle class and affluent left leaning people who kind of vote on style, not substance. She would probably outright lose. Like I think if there's a Michael Bloomberg candidate in this election, she 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 would be finished. Uh, I yeah. think because he is at the end of the day just the guy who like trolls Ilhan Omar and voted to you know overturn the 2020 election and, and you know indulge entirely in the far right. I think that will probably cap him, um, but he's gotten very far being that guy, and I think that is because he's not stupid, and he's really sanded down the edges off of that, and really stopped talking about Trump, and just talked about crime and quality of life almost entirely, and and that discipline has paid off for him so far. Yeah. Uh, last thing, shifting gears a little bit, you're you've written about Ukraine. Um, yes. So what are your what's your take on Ukraine? What's my take? Wow, what's my take on Ukraine? How much time do you have? I mean, look, it, it's a it's horrible. You know, Russia 
you know, very much is the instigator here. They launched a horrific and stupid invasion, and it has caused, you know, absurd amounts of, of damage, you know, both in, in the literal sense and the economic sense. And, and, and Putin deserves to be condemned. You know, I, I'm i not an apologist for Putin yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, again, you have to give the preamble because then right. my next point is, and I think you're actually starting to see it quietly. You see articles about it that the, even the Biden administration is now starting to back channel diplomacy. And my, my view from March has always been you have to avoid a nuclear confrontation at all costs, and you have to find a way to escalate. You have to find a way to um, attempt diplomacy to end this war as soon as possible. For a long time, liberals didn't want to hear it. Um, a lot of them don't want to hear it still. They think, let's put you know, up four unlimited amounts of, of arms into Ukraine and, and destroy Russia. You can't destroy Russia. It's impossible. It will never happen. And... Um, giving unlimited amounts of military aid, more than we gave to uh, funneled into basically at this point, Iraq and Afghanistan it is something that deserves scrutiny. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, we, we have to, you know, in a time where we're saying that we have to cut funding in so many other ways, you know, you absolutely have to scrutinize, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars in military aid. So I do support diplomacy. I just support de-escalation. I don't want a nuclear confrontation. That would be a disaster. And I hope Biden and Europe can bring Zelensky and Putin to the table because that's what's going to have to happen. That's the only way this ends or you get a war for five or ten years and hundreds of thousands of people die, if not even more, or you get something more catastrophic. And I don't want a World War One. I. I don't want uh, a nuclear war. Um, I, I want peace. There's no easy way to peace. There's no convenient way to peace. I think that's where liberals get very angry. And go, oh, you're saying concessions, but you know, you have to really um, consider diplomacy. And I think that the good news is that even the United States is in that boat now. Yeah, I think it's a bit uh, delayed, um, but yeah, a bit delayed. A bit delayed. Yeah. Well, I will let you go because I hear people are yes, really people are shouting now. What, what are they chatting about? Night. What are they chatting about? Oh, Tom, just the state controllers on stage, uh, just That's being exciting. excited and trying to yeah. get people excited. Nothing is coming yet, but they're doing their rally thing. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ross, for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Right. Any predictions? Last Sorry. Predictions? Any last uh, final? Predictions? Uh, I guess Republicans take the Senate and the House and. Uh, hope we'll find a way to win. That'd be my final prediction. But we'll see. I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a genius. I don't have a crystal ball. But right. That's my lazy prediction. All right. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. All right, guys. That was Ross Barkin, and uh, we are going to bring in our next guest. Very excited. Also, let me just tell you guys something. Please like this stream. It's a very easy way to support the show. Also. If you can become Patreon supporters, you can do that patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. If you are a useful idiot, you can become useful idiot supporters at usefulidiots.substack.com. We just added a new feature where every Thursday we do a Thursday throwdown and we analyze uh, the media uh, that doesn't fit into the Sunday morning news shows. Uh, you can also come into my onto our call-ins. We have useful idiot call-ins. We also have Katie Helper Show call-ins. I probably won't do one tonight because it's going to be too late, but I usually do them every Tuesday right after my stream. And guys, I, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, we're doing a live taping of the Katie Helper Show. This is very exciting. At the People's Forum, we're doing a live taping of the Katie Helper Show. Uh, the guest will be Miko Pellet. Some of you have seen me interview him. Miko Pellet is uh, a, the, let me just do a screen share so you can get the, the, the image for this. Miko Pellet is a um, Israeli American activist. He's the son of a very decorated, famous uh, Israeli general. This general, Mati Pellet, uh, his father, became a big critic of uh, Israel. He met with Palestinians. Uh, and then Miko, his son, that's Miko right there. Miko, his son, um, is started as a proud Zionist. Uh, again, his father was this very decorated uh, general. Then his grandfather on the other side, his mother's uh, father, was a uh, signatory to Israeli independence. He tragically lost his niece in a suicide bombing. And he is a major activist and a one-state solution supporter. So he believes in one state. 
that he's does not believe in Israel being a Jewish state. And he's uh, great. And he will be talking about his book, The General Son, which is a really moving story. He'll also be talking about um, his uh, about the Israeli elections that just happened. And um, it's going to be a great event. It's a live taping here. I'm just going to take you to the, uh, the, the website for the People's Forum. Here it is. Uh, and you can just go and reply there. You send your RSVP. It's a free taping of the Katie Halper Show. I'll be there in person, obviously. If you're not in the tri-state area, then you can't make it. You can still watch. Uh, we're going to be live streaming it. But uh, definitely try to come out if you can. It's the first time we're doing a Katie Halper Show in years since the pandemic. And it's going to be great. And Miko's a great speaker. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. And we're going to bring in our next guest. And we're going to be uh, watching some uh, coverage because I know that you guys are excited about that. We can apply the drinking game. Coming into the stream right now is the inimitable Leslie Lee of Struggle Session and Culture, the show on Colin. Hello, Leslie. Hey, Kay. How's it going? Good. You? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Yeah, I like the beard. Oh, thank you. It's new. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At least I haven't seen you in a while, so maybe yeah. it's, maybe it's not very new, but it's new to me. Yeah. How's uh how how are her things where you are? Any exciting races by you? Oh yes, we had a uh, Hung Cow versus uh, Jennifer Wexton. That was uh, one that got a lot of attention. You know, they sparred over inflation and abortion. Hung Cow, the Republican Captain Cow, as he I likes to be called, because he's a military. That's his main like thing. Is that like he was in the military, and we need to know that he's in. He was in the military, Katie. If you don't know, he was in the he military. Was, okay. All right. Okay, that's good. That's uh, you got to get that front and center. Yeah, he did like half his campaign commercials in like his fatigues. That's so funny. <laughs> and stuff, but yeah, he uh, he's he's kind of a ghoul, a creep, but does not look like he is going to win. So far, so far, uh, here in uh, Northern Virginia, so far is is still looking like West Wexton's going to hold it. Mm. All right. All right. Well, um. Oh, and Sam, sorry, Sam K asks, um, will Miko be signing his book? Would love to get one. He will be signing his book. And Leslie, you co-hosted with me when Miko was on, remember? Oh, Miko yes, Pella? Yes. Yeah, that was a great conversation. Um, so, guys, Wilson, are you there? Wilson, Wilson of Useful Idiots fame. Hi, Wilson, how's it going? Awesome. How's everybody doing? This is cool being on Katie Helper Show, too. I've never done it. Yeah, mm. I know. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you give us a, a taste? What should we watch right now? What can you show us? Because you're well, you're controlling the clips. What do we got? Right, I got all three streams going. I'm watching Fox, uh, CNN, and MSNBC all at once. And wow, I feel like we I'm should sorry. go start with the. Uh, we got the current Karnaki cam, but okay, John King with his okay. uh, his magic wall that they love to talk about. Yeah. Uh, he's going there. He is right there with right. with our favorite let's Jake Tapper. Tap. Okay, let's hear what they're saying. Let's do volume up. All right. Here, number one, Senator Warnock was above fifty. Number two, Senator Warnock is in the lead. Yeah. Herschel cool. Walker, the Republican candidate, now in the lead by nine thousand votes, up to fifty-five oh percent. Uh, I would say prepare for a little bit of a seesaw ahead. But the to the point David Challey was making in our last conversation, as they begin to count more of the today vote, election day cast votes, that's where Republicans have an edge. Boris just noted. Governor Kemp stretching his lead a bit. It's the very same dynamic. They're counting election day votes now. We're starting to count them as we move through the hour and the hours ahead. So uh, remember, it took us a long time in 2020, new. and those runoffs were close. So now we come, uh, we come back here. I'm sorry, come back here to the Senate race, and you just look at this. This, this is this is the state of Georgia You're today. So in love with their tech. I know a state, a 9,000 vote lead. You're beginning to see the map fill wow. in. If you're in the Walker Ooh. campaign, number one, you still got 45 percent of the ways to go. But you also see, you, again, see some of these rural counties. They're small, but what we have no votes truly at amazing all. Those race are going to be red. At the end I know, right? Walker. So the challenge is, I just want to go check up here a little bit. So you first just, come to Fulton County. Senator okay. Warnock getting 75% of the vote. Let's just go back and look at 2020 and be the presidential race. I mean, as a true Joe Biden getting 73%. Alone, there was so, so much we come back here. I just want to check. There. So Senator Warnock doing what he has to do in Fulton County, at least at the moment, as we continue to count. Then you go over to Cobb County, right? It's, you see it's a more competitive suburb, but Joe Biden won it by 14 points. Now let's come back to where we are and look at the Senate race in Cobb County. 
and it's a 20 point race. So around the Atlanta area at the moment, they do love the Warnock there the doing area. quite well. And what he needs to do, just want to come over. Yeah, and their the big thing I've seen a lot of the sites doing this is comparing so in Atlanta, Biden's in suburbs, numbers uh, Senator Warnock to whatever's going strong. on in the district. The question right. is where are the Walker right. votes coming from? So let's see. Wow. One of the challenges was, you know, do the Trump voters turn out? Or not Donald Trump, right? So what do you well, think? That's should where we talk, Brian Kemp we, helps. Even uh, though Brian Kemp and Donald Trump are in a feud, race? you have a Republican governor running well race. ahead of Herschel Walker. Oh, my thoughts on this race it's is just, it's, again, it's I, I don't know what to say. American politics are shameful. Well, it's it's yeah. like... Dozens of them. And those they should, the Democrats so actually, I, I mean, is he's literally, is in the South. He's a black guy with multiple... You know, cases in the fidelity against him. You should be able to beat him. You should be yeah. able to beat him like fairly easily. How right. like bad is your brand that is even in question? Like it that's the core sort of thing that should take down other candidates that are other Republicans. Like for him to be on the uh ticket right. should like be like a danger to them. Like they should be wanting him want would have wanted him out of the right. race. But the fact that that's not the case shows how like what rough it is out there for the Dems. Yeah, I mean, it's just funny because he's like an anti-choicer, obviously, and like several women have said that he's paid for their abortions. Yes, I just completed other obvious hypocrisy that I it's hard to imagine that a, a Democratic Party that had any sort of you know inroads or backbone or anything would wouldn't be able to like knock this one out of the park like this is right. just there's all to be a layup well you are from the south yourself so any uh any insights into this as a southerner it, it ties in this i think that just the democrats have mostly abandoned the south like period more or less so that's why even the like the biggest kooks there with like stuff coming out about them can still win there like there is some there's people i'm sure there's people on the ballot that are running unopposed in a lot of you know state you know level races that are and that's just actually really ridiculous but that's how like much the democrats have given up on like making any inroads in the south right someone in the comments which i'm trying i've been tr i've been good i've been trying to ignore the comments that are triggering but uh, this one isn't triggering. I think it's interesting. Someone writes, "You literally have a demented guy as president. Why are you talking? Why are you talking about bad candidates instead of how the system has become completely corrupt?" I don't think Leslie's too much of a Joe Biden fan. Yeah, I'm not a Joe Biden fan. <laughs> Joe Biden would also be an example of how uh, ridiculous American politics have gotten. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Should we watch some more returns? Watch oh, some yes. more coverage. What do we got next, Wilson? Uh, let's see. Should we go to the Kornacki cam? Sure. Let's see what we got from Kornacki. He's good. He might be on break. Oh. Oh. I love watching this, though. Let's see. What do we got? He's just playing over there. He'll come get a drink of water. We can't see it. I think you have to add to stream. There we go. Oh, this is him on break, right? Yeah. Oh, Beasley's winning. Oh, it's too early to call. All right. Yeah. Okay. This is when he's on break and they just leave the camera on. Oh, wait. So <laughs> Warnock, who's winning? War oh, Warnock is winning. I thought he was losing. Looks like more results coming in. Maybe, Leslie, I think people heard us talking. Yes, they, they heard us talking. They got out there. They walkers. stayed in yeah. line. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, let's. Uh... Switch over to Fox. Oh, it looks like All DeSantis right. is talking. Oh, let's watch DeSantis. He's so annoying. What did Trump call him? DeSanctimonious. Yeah. And yeah, he's uh, apparently won his race. All right, let's hear what we got from Ron. Now, thanks to the overwhelming support of the people of Florida, we not only won election, we have rewritten the political map. Oh, you hate to see these guys feeling themselves. It's the worst. I know. It's the worst vibes. 
I want to thank all of our campaign staff from campaign manager Janera Peck down. This was the best run campaign in the history of Florida politics. The history of Florida politics. Wow. I want to thank all of our wonderful Does he have the same nasally voice as Jake Tapper? So to get out the vote. Your support but means the world. The KCNI. I can't God really bless do it. You I feel like when he talks, he also talks like the Jake Tapper I mean, voice. Kind of a little bit, yeah. But for me, what's really now, annoying about it is... it's a lot easier to run his... a good campaign when you got a great record to run on. And I would not have been able to see the level he of has very huge, that we saw like... unless... I had outstanding oh, personnel no. working in the executive I want to say car sales, but maybe well. yeah. more specific than that. These folks he looks like he'd be a real to prick to work agenda. for. They oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. He reminds me of someone who'd be in that, like, from office space. Support. Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah. Office space manager. Thank yeah. you to Miami-Dade County. What are they Thank saying? You. They free Jim themselves. Palm Beach County. Okay. Oh no, he's just gonna go through all the places that he wants. <laughs> Great. Now we're still uh, telling he's doing the, the his, votes, a but his shout outs like a rapper. Right. This election, we will have the different hoods, a significant number looking. of votes from people who may not have voted for me four years voted. ago. And I just want to let you know, I am honored to have earned your trust and your support over these four years. Oh God. That looks like Shakira. Ooh, what is she? What is going on over there? Yeah. What is, what is that with a Tarzan neckline? The greatest that is, first lady uh, in all that's a choice. States. Yeah. That's a contrast. Yeah, seriously. With the overall looks, aesthetic. Yeah, like a Dancing with the Stars outfit. Yeah. For being a great wife, giving unwavering support, being a tremendous mother. Uh, to our three young children. Did he and win like leadership of District 12 the in the 100 games? Because that would be the appropriate dress for that. Yeah. Answer. She is remarkable. Wow. How old is she? She looks a lot younger than him. Mm. Brad, can you put up your comments again? Now, I didn't see it. Today, the fascist was just reelected directly after knowingly misappropriating funds to lie to immigrants in order to put on a campaign stunt not seen since Jim Crow. This is not a good sign. Yeah. Now today is the culmination. Yeah, it's of like the Democrats can't even be like elections. corrupt. But in reality, Americans yeah. have been no. voting for many years now. They've been voting with their feet. And the results of that behavior he always uses his hands. has been just like. as stark as our landslide victory today. States and cities governed by Giant leftist politicians behind him. have seen crime skyrocket. Oh, here we go. They've seen their taxpayers abused. They've seen medical authoritarianism imposed and they've seen American principles discarded. The woke agenda oh, has here we caused go. millions oh, here we go. of Americans to leave these jurisdictions for greener pastures. The woke agenda. I can't woke believe agenda. that this is like, that's a major now, issue. Great exodus of, course. of Americans. That was just a joke on For Twitter. those folks, <laughs> Florida, for so many of go them, away. has served as the promised land. Oh my God. We, we have embraced freedom. We okay. have maintained law and order. We have protected the rights of parents. Okay. We have respected Not our taxpayers not for nothing, but I do not think woke you can say you have maintained wallet order in Florida at any yeah, point. Seriously, in Florida history, not for not, not to go down that path, we right? Schools, we fight the woke and the corporations. Oh we will God. never ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes oh to my die. God. Well, it's where a lot of stuff goes to die, but. <laughs> People wow. have come here because our policies work. Leadership matters. Is that why they go we to Florida? I thought people went to Florida because the weather was nice. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I Leader thought that was retire. mostly why people they leave. They're retiring and the weather is nice. We set out it's good a vision. for their lungs. The we executed clouds. on that vision and we produced historic You know where she met? Results. You know where he met and his the wife? people of this state no, have responded yes. in record fashion. Um... Church. No, but now, very Republican. Flounders due to golf course. Yes. In Washington, oh, okay. Florida they is met on a golf the course. Right yeah. Track. 
She does look was, a little like Sh Shakira. Wait, did she work there or was she American golfing? I think she was golfing. Requires Let's see. a revival of true American principles. Florida. He was then a naval officer. They met on a golf done. course. They married we in September offer, 2010. We offer a ray of hope. They have two daughters and a son. Madison, Mamie, and I Mason. I am proud of our achievements in this <laughs> Why'd they do that? I am honored Madison, by Mamie, your support. And and Mason? Mason. Yeah. To the road ahead. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race in this first turn. He's talking about himself with a lot fight. of importance. <laughs> we've accomplished more than anybody thought possible four years ago, but we've got so much more to do, and I have only begun to fight. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for a historic landslide victory. Wow. Wow. Represent is the major winner, lives here. One Jeez. winning re-election for governor in Florida. Britt, do you want oh, to That's the Verhoeven in? shot oh, right there. Well, that's the Verhoeven that, shot. What do you mean? It looks like it's something from Paul Verhoeven. Why? The flag, his, for his own demeanor, oh, right, right, right. her right. dress, <laughs> her outfit. <laughs> and there you see the family. We were a little uh, kid. Part of the campaign. Right. Wife, and Verhoeven major anti be a skating critique, right? Former TV broadcaster herself. And a big asset on that campaign. Ron DeSantis winning in places that other so much Florida confetti, governors have the not digital won, camera as cannot keep up. Jeb Bush yeah. in 2002. Now we've got some calls to make. In the first of the two Oklahoma Oklahoma Senate races this year, Fox News can project that GOP Senator James Lankford will win a second Oof. full term in office. And in the special election, we project that Republican Mark Wayne Mullen will defeat Oof. Democrat Kendra Horn. Moving to Connecticut, where Democratic Senator, the incumbent, Richard Blumenthal, wins the third term okay. by defeating Republican businesswoman, Leora Levy. Over to Texas and the governor's race, where we can now project <laughs> that Governor Greg Abbott will remain in the Max's governor's cousin. mansion for a third term. Oh, Blumenthal, yeah. High-profile okay. Democratic oh, candidate, no. Beto O'Rourke. A lot will be Leave said. There for uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot will be said about this uh, <laughs> yes. this race, because this is uh, multiple efforts on the part of Beto How could not multiple Abbott? Efforts so and awful. multiple <laughs> Tens How could they not find someone better to run than Beto? Yeah. Focus on Beto O'Rourke as a candidate, Britt. O'Rourke is becoming the Charlie oh, Crisp. Hume. I love him. It's so funny. <laughs> oh, the sure Fox News people, oh, they got some shade. Yeah. He's yeah. the Charlie yeah. Crisp of Texas. And, uh, <laughs> not, not that other phony name. Yeah, I mean, he's gone from the cover of Vanity Fair magazine and this shining hope of the Democrat Party. Jessica, you know, your thoughts on mm. what, what has happened to, to Beto O'Rourke? It he, says a lot about the power of the media because they really did want to make that dude happen for a little bit. And it just did not work. If they forgot he was in Texas, Casey as well. <laughs> maybe the right. that yeah. doesn't work in Texas, like about, your markets you know, are, you know, New York and Los Angeles. Right. Yeah. Right? There are a lot of people yeah. whose races are I think the focus closer. groups weren't that representative in North Carolina, where he was running, uh, yeah. I'm not saying that she's going to end up pulling that off. Uh, Jonathan Cadman is you know, in Houston. Could go. Um, that maybe that Jonathan, money, any insights as a Houstonian? expected there in New Hampshire. Um, defending Nevada, things like that, giving more money in a Pennsylvania, maybe to uh, Tim Ryan, who had to go it alone without Chuck Schumer's support yeah. um, at the end there. Um, you know, these are celebrity candidates. I think that there have been incredible messaging moments that kind of have rallied the Democratic base and made you really focus on the issues that matter to us as a party. But they are seemingly just not great candidates to win statewide office, and I hope people will take stock of that. Okay, we can also project that is Democratic she a Governor Democrat? uh, Dan McKee will win like the first full Democratic term in analysis. office, defeating another uh, She GOP looks a little bit like um, Klaus. Kennedy. Remember and Kennedy? Kennedy? Oh, yes, yes. Ned Lamont will defeat GOP candidate. I said, why does so many of the VJs finally, turn the out right wing? Yeah. We can project that Republican Governor Chris Sununu, Cuck Sununu, oh Sununu, who endorsed Dahlbach, yeah, Baldock, Baldock. Uh, he also possibly has Dana other Perino from from. Well, uh, so there was a heavy from attempt w to recruit him to run for the Senate in New Hampshire, and he didn't want to do that. And and I can understand. So you know, Chris when you're, Sununu, when you're Leslie, governor, you know he you are the endorsed your state. this the guy CEO Don Baldock, who New Hampshire, and he who thought, Why is I running against to Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. And be one of a hundred, not even though done. He wanted Baldock to sink his teeth into things. Called I don't know if he actually Sununu has a to communist, run for president. Chinese communist sympathizer, you know, supporter that, of terrorism. That doesn't need to be made for a little while, unless we're but talking. But Sununu, and Sununu called him a conspiracy theorist during the primary. 
right. in this, but then he the won the primary. This Balda guy, thanks to the Democrats, which is one of the races yeah. that the Dems yeah. poured yeah. tons of money, money in. Yeah, yeah. 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 Piper yeah. thing. Governor's winning. Oh, by by I love this guy. Mm. You know, the hope if you're a Republican is that they will All they day. will Sorry. pull across the finish line some of these embattled candidates for the Senate who are in really tight races. Uh, yeah, you I gotta say, Georgia, all these race, Florida, the people doing well, the so race covers, they are, they're yeah, getting you see up it, there. You see it yeah. Like, yeah. Every yeah. network example, has somebody that just he, looks a little, they should have, to maybe be considering retiring. Yeah. Yeah. They should be in we'll see, we'll see what happens yes. in Arizona as well with Kerry Lake and Blake Masters. Okay, let's head over to Bill Hammer. All right, and Congrats, yes, in my opinion, this speaks to the epic failure of the Democratic yeah, Party to effectively here, rebut various bullshit Carolina narratives platformed from every facet of the media. We need uh, fighters and got Washington general. To the House races <laughs> of Virginia. <laughs> Not the uh, thanks general. For being oh, okay, Leslie, got, um, coming Virginia close to too. home for you. Jen right, Kagan, she got about 60% of the vote. In. She's got a lead here of 19,000 raw votes, about 11% uh -huh. on the board. So she continues to... I mean, we saw this, what, about an hour and a half ago, she took the lead. She's maintained that lead uh, in Virginia, too. They like that run there. Uh, Virginia 7, closer to Washington, D.C. So this is Spanberger's race with Yesley Vega. What, what oh, I so see, that's guys, switched is, a little bit. This, this oh. Race getting closer yeah. throughout the night. Spangberger, um, she's like, pretends that, right it's, now, that the Dems are too woke to and too defund the police. With the difference of about 6,300 there yeah, in and Virginia. Let, and and is just a, a kind of saying, bit of a loon. Um, ah, really? Let's pop down yeah. here to Georgia and watch what's happening with Warnock and Walker. All right. Warnock, about 30 minutes ago, had gone below 50%. He popped wow. up again. Remember, 50% in Georgia. The Warnock pop. Need to be <laughs> the Warnock from, uh, Four weeks from now. My iron passion police. race. He has been pretty consistent from, from what I'm seeing, well above 50% now for or really, I guess, ever since the polls closed two hours ago. So Kemp is running at 51.6. Walker's running at 47.1. So again, it's about that four point spread that you see in a, uh, between uh, between Walker and between Kemp. Let me get out here. Hey, one thing, Bill. Yes, go ahead. There's a Libertarian in the, race in the Senate no. race Voice that's sunny. getting three times the vote mm -hmm. of the Libertarian in the governor's race in Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if that factors yep. in, but yep. th there is a difference there. Yeah, and it, it could take some votes away, and we're going to see. I, I can't reflect that on the board behind yeah, here. Yeah, here but, uh, but listen, Which team point? has the best be set? Because I have to say question. so Can far, I in Ohio before I kick it back over honestly, I think the Fo uh, Fox News Ohio. uses too much white. Uh -huh. There's Guys, something race to race. it. There's uh, something this is really interesting. I mean, a little it, bit, I don't know, daring, about, about oh, open, ago. I should say. Uh, vote it. total of 23,000. Yes. Here's what I would think What do you think of MSNBC? Should we tune into MSNBC or yes, CNN? Yes, let's, see, let's compare Let's MSNBC. compare, yeah. Let's see, oh, actually, how's Vance doing? Was Vance winning? And I, uh, I didn't JD. see, but... Yeah. Oh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders projected to win Arkansas governor. Oh, my, oh my God. Gosh. Oh, Steve my on, God. Is Steve on break again? Yeah, he's on break he's again. Always what on is, break, and they keep the camera there? on. He's just in a little room in the screen. That's all right. Let's know, see what CNN. Little... What do we got on CNN? Wait, I don't know. Is that MSNBC? Because I'm looking at MSNBC, yeah. or is that NBC News? Oh, I don't know. What are you looking at? Yeah, I got like live coverage. Oh. I think you might just be on the Kornacki cam. Oh my God, is there a Kornacki cam? How do we get to MSNBC, Wilson? We need um, we need to see like what Joanne Reed is saying. How do we get there? Or maybe maybe I'm just a little bit behind you. Maybe okay. you're behind. All right. Let's but see. yeah, I had people talking a little bit. Ago. No, you're right. I'm just on the Kronaki cam. Oh, I just okay. learned too much. I'll, I'll, I'll get us a new one. There's an actual thing dedicated to it. How sad is that, guys? <laughs> That's really that They actually have a separate thing for just Kornacki. That's so funny. That's so funny. I mean, it's good. He deserves his own camera. Uh, I suppose. But again, I don't feel like the MSNBC production. It feels a little bit warmer. It does, Fox yeah. Fox News, but yeah. I don't know if it's more enough. welcoming. But that's because it's just one guy's room. Well, let's see. <laughs> let's see what. Uh, all right, let's see what we got for MSNBC non Kornacki cam. Five percent of the voting. Here's CNN doing a breaking alert while I get a new MSNBC. Okay, 
lead, but it's close. Oh, J.D. Vance is winning. Oh, my God. It is close. Democratic Congressman, 49.7%. John King is going to need to walk us through where the votes are still out to let us know if it's and actually going to And did you hear his close. his little revelation that the reason he became now, like a Carolina, Republican is because Red people made fun of his the movie Sherry based on his book? No, really? Yeah, like, 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 a like that's, that's why he kind of shifted more towards the right because the, right. the elite, the cultural the elite, right. the liberals Carolina. made fun right, of his little Netflix New movie. Hampshire, where we've got Maggie Hassan sitting at 57 Okay, she's going to, all right. John Baldock sitting at So Wow, I think people I thought this would be, going to be a lot Democrats closer. Talking to her, looking at these numbers, say Hassan is in a very strong position at this. Wow, hour, but I thought it was going to be closer. Thirty percent of the vote in. So we'll keep but then again, only thirty percent in. Now let's go only out 30 to Colorado. In, yes. yeah. this again, a reach for Republicans. Michael Bennett. Bennett at 58. I should recuse myself because his father was the Republican president of Wesleyan University when I was there. I can't really say anything. Of course, we do need to know where the votes are coming I'm too in. Too pro Bennett. Looking at forty percent of them. So far, now let's check in on Wisconsin. Expected to be one of the tightest uh, races on the map tonight. So take these numbers with a grain of salt. Whoa! Edwards in the early vote, out to seventy percent ahead of Ron Johnson, the incumbent. Only four percent. Oh yeah, and only four percent. That would be great right if you won. Sure John Ron Johnson explain to terrible. us why it looks that way. Uh, there's about four percent of the vote in right now in Wisconsin. See the now CNN version. Too in love with the tech. Very cold and human. There was an Iowa poll late in the cycle from a very trustworthy Whoa. pollster Rack out there that showed terrible. Chuck Grassley, the incumbent Republican, in a tight race with Democrat Michael Franken, and some early returns show Franken out ahead, 58.3 percent to Chuck Grassley's 41.6 percent. But there is very little vote in in Iowa at this hour. We only have 11 percent in. Let's also dip in on Pennsylvania, where John Fetterman, the Democrats, at 60.5 percent. These numbers are moving in real time. The Dr. Mehmet Oz. Whoa, here we go. This is something this is another situation more resembling what reality should maybe be. Already right. Challenges, questions about how these votes are going to be counted. And we expect that's going to go late. Into oh, the, the steal is already in. They're already starting the steal. <laughs> what do you mean? Did, <laughs> see, they, she just mentioned about something about, oh, there's going to be some questions about oh, the votes yeah. being counted. Yeah. Like, right. like, see, it is already starting the narrative before they can even get going. There we have an update. Incumbent Republican Greg Abbott building on Actually, the earlier lead he had on hmm. Beto O'Rourke, the former congressman, 149,000 votes ahead for the two-term, uh, two-time governor of Texas, 52% of the vote in there. He's so Let's evil, the Abbott. Georgia, yes. Brian Kemp right now with 111,000 vote advantage over Stacey Abrams, 66% Oof. of the vote in. Notably, he is above that 50% threshold, meaning he could potentially avoid a runoff if this holds. And we just got an wow. update there. Now 115,000 vote lead for Kemp. Let's take a look at the state Ooh. of Michigan. Incumbent Democrat Gretchen Whitmer locked in this tough re-election battle with conservative Not commentator, that former TV host Tudor Dixon. A 42,000 vote advantage for Whitmer, roughly an 8% lead right now. Oh. Still very yeah. early with only 12% of the vote in. Let's get an update for you from Pennsylvania. There, the Attorney General, Josh Shapiro, he has nearly a 300,000 vote advantage over Doug Mastriano, one of the most extreme candidates you are going to see. Yeah, Mastriano is another one who of the, the Dems the helped. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, one that our Jake Tapper knows very well. Jake. All right, Boris, thanks so much. Let's take a look uh, at, at this governor's race right now in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, Josh Shapiro, the, the sitting attorney general running for governor uh, against a state legislator named Doug Mastriano that Boris uh, just aptly described. But what's going on here? So you're watching, it fills in more votes coming in, as you say. It's a nearly 300,000 vote lead for Josh Shapiro at the moment, who was favored in the late polls in this race. But if you just want to go through, just want to go through a place. I was just looking at one place. Uh, this, uh, this is should we switch over to Rachel Maddow? Most yeah, Rachel. Yeah. Long commercial. A lot of Marine Joe stuff. Oh. No, no Maddow? No Maddow. Morning Joe stuff? What's What do we got on MSN? Oh, I see, I see Maddow. Oh, here we go. There we go, Rach. Once was in 2002, right after 9-11, and one was in 1934. The president's party, whatever party holds the White House, the first midterm after that president... Now, I do like the MSNBC the graphics the now, most. The Republicans only yeah, they're clean. ...five seats in order yes. to win the majority in the House of Representatives this year. Historically, 
just looking at the numbers, they are likely to do that. Now, what looks like a normal midterm pickup number for the party that's out of power? Well, in the last midterm in 2018... Oh, and look, I like they got proposals up, 40 seats. you know. And the Republican before that... In Not the just before the that, elections, I like that. The Democrats were in power in the White House, they lost 13 seats. In 2010, the midterm before that, Democrats lost 63 seats. Hmm. In 2006, the Republicans had the White House, they lost... 30 seats. Definitely well, the most aesthetically 30, soothing yes. graphics. Yes. Very well, that, pleasing laid out. It is, yeah. Well, I have, not that I don't love watching Rachel Maddow, we're going to go back to her, but we have an even more exciting person to bring on, even more exciting than Rachel Maddow. And that is none other than Marianne Williamson. <laughs> Hi, Marianne. Hi, Katie. So more exciting than Rachel Maddow. I know. That's, damning that's kind of like damning with, yeah, that's damning exactly. with fam, faint praise. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? Good. You've good. met, you've virtually met before, <clears throat> Leslie and Hello. Marianne. Hello nice again. to see you. Nice to see you again. So what are you thinking, Marianne? What are your thoughts on tonight? I'm, I'm feeling heartbroken for some of these candidates who are coming in so close and might not make it. Uh, you know, some of these people are, you know, whether it has to do with Stacy, whether it has to do with Beto, people who are working so hard. And, you know, when you, I, I know when I was down in Texas and I was saying something nice about Beto and all these people were saying, eh, I was saying, what do you need to know? Except that he's not Greg Abbott. Hmm. I mean, I think that it's so important that we remember that whether we are particularly excited about one candidate or another, what the Republican Party at this point represents is something truly egregious. And um, we're in a state of cold, you know, cold civil war, I think, here at this point. And uh, something like somebody, I read somewhere that 43 election deniers have already been elected. So it's not a hyperbole to say that democracy is on the line. Mm. But also, as people like you and I uh, see, uh, democracy has not been, in FDR's words, delivering on its promises. And the corporatist element uh, of the Democratic Party, um, it's so funny, they, they act like progressives are trying to hijack the party, but really they're the ones who hijacked the party. And they took it away from the traditional pillars uh, established by FDR, by which the Democratic Party was an unabashed and unequivocal advocate for the working people of the United States. And that trajectory has been a spectacular failure. I mean, the fact that these races are even close, it's just, there's no way these things should be close, given the fact that the modern Republican Party does not want to do anything to help people. So I think that uh, starting tomorrow, starting when all this particular drama is over, whether the Republicans ultimately win the House or Democrats win the House, um, we have to get started. We have to get started with generating a new chapter in American history, or our democracy will be swollen up by these neo-fascist forces. I honestly believe that. What uh, do you have any insights as a as a Texan into what's happening in Texas? <clears throat> well, you know, a lot of people in Texas look at people like myself and say, you guys left. And I've thought about that. A lot of people that I know who left Texas have thought about that. We just went, oh, to hell with this. This is ridiculous. You know, the, the Bush family is down here and it's all going to, you know, going red and not just, it wasn't just Republican versus Democrat. I mean, we know that, that we understand about the corporate duopoly, et cetera, but, but still any chance of progressivism versus, and, uh, there was just kind of a mass exodus of a lot of people who now uh, feel like, uh, well, I know I feel great admiration for the people who are working so hard, not just on democratic politics, because we all know that that's problematic in ways, but real progressive politics down in Texas. Uh, I met Beto when I was running in 20, um, and I think he's a nice man. I don't agree with him about everything. He's got some neoliberal corporate stuff. I mean, he's, running on what he's running on, but um, Greg Abbott represents something so awful, so awful. So, you know, last time I looked, you know, Beto still might pull this out. I mean, some of these are, you know, they still might pull it out. 
And I hope he does, because I think that uh, Beto represents the heart of Texas as I know it. Abbott certainly represents the spleen of Texas or something. <laughs> he represents the money of billionaires in Texas. Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. That's all he represents. He represents billionaire money. The money in, in politics is, is destroying our country. You know, Louis Brandeis said you can have large amounts of money concentrated in the hands of a very few, or you can have democracy. You cannot have both. And this massive transfer of wealth and opportunity into the hands of 1% has just, it's just blocked our representative democracy. But I do think that if the Democratic Party hadn't been willing to try to play, have it both ways over the last 40 years, I mean, it's true that, that you know, the Republican, uh, Republican president started this neoliberal madness, although our friend Harvey Kay would say it actually started with Carter. But it started this big time with Reagan. But no Democratic president has stopped it. You know, I feel like the the Republican Party obviously has just been taken over completely by this corporate back mentality. And the Democrats, it's like they say, we really feel bad about the suffering that this has caused. But even they will not challenge the underlying corporate forces that make all that suffering inevitable. So I think that, you know, one side is a big lie, but the other side is some truth, but it's not the whole truth and it's not nothing but the truth. We need some radical truth telling now. Um, and if we don't have that radical truth telling about what really went wrong over the last 40 years and reckoning with what's really gone wrong over the last over 260 years, then uh, I, I, don't see any, I don't see any way out of the path towards a violent revolution. The only way we're not going to have a violent revolution in this country is if we wage a nonviolent revolution. You know, JFK said that those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And I think we need a, a revolution in this country. We need revolution against the neoliberal madness uh, by which so much hope and opportunity and money went into the hands of such a tiny few while so many people suffer. We have a third. If you, if you put together the poor, the near poor, and the fr afraid of becoming poor, you have a third of America's population. Mm. You, you know, we, we, we don't need any more evidence how corrupt the system is. We can see it in the, sh you know, shuttered factories and the broken windows and the hollow eyes of addicted and desperate and hopeless people who are, who are apparently in Washington. You know, I live in Washington, you know, and uh, they say that it's a, it's a bubble. It's more than a bubble. It's a walled off city. It's like, what leading politician even use, says the word poor? They didn't even mention no. poverty. The, the, these are people who, who the, the, the money and the power buffers them from any sensitivity, any real, not only the experience of hunger, but even allowing themselves to imagine what it would feel like to be hungry. So we know this. The problems tonight are not how many Republicans are voting. The problem is how many people should stand for what the Democratic Party should stand for, who are staying home. But it's the only way they have to say, fuck you. Mm. Because it's the only way they have to resist. And I think the only hope really for this country is for the Democratic Party to reclaim that FDR type, New Deal, unequivocal, unabashed stand for the working people of the United States. I'm curious what you uh, were referring to with Harvey K talking about Carter. Have Harvey on and talk. Okay. But anytime, anytime I say, oh, you know, this started with Reagan, he says, no, no, no. And he'll, but he can explain his okay. position better than I can. But he has, he takes real issue with uh, uh, Jimmy Carter, too. He says geo, that, that Jimmy Carter, he said, started the pathway to the neoliberal. Um, huh. I mean, to me, yeah. Jimmy Carter is the one who had, you know, he had solar panels on the on the roof of the White House. And right. then the first thing Reagan did was he took them down. So I hadn't thought of, you know, but, but Harvey can explain Harvey better than okay. I can. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, what are your plans? I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about it all, but I think a lot of it has to do with what happens tonight. I think, I, I think no matter what happens tonight, we have to begin a new chapter of American history. We must. Because right now, the Republicans represent a nosedive, 
and the Democrats represent a managed decline. So they're both the, the, the corporate led, uh, corporate aspects of the parties are a status quo that will not disrupt itself. And we can't, you know, it, so let's say the Democrats hold the, hold the Senate tonight. So we don't go over the cliff. We're still six inches from the cliff. We're still on the Titanic, headed towards the iceberg, just a little more slowly. And we have to generate a field of possibility for actually turning it around. And that's not incremental change. That's not just ticking a little bit, you know, tacking a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. It's actually turning things around. There's a radicalism to that. But I think, you know, you were talking about Harvey Kay. Harvey Kay, and I agree on that, that there's a radicalism to the very idea of America, which is the repudiation of tyranny. How ironic that these people who are voting for the tyrants talk about doing so as a way of overthrowing tyranny. It's corporate tyranny that is the tyranny that has, that has this country in a chokehold today. It's the tyranny of the corporate aristocracy, of the insurance companies, of the pharmaceutical companies, the big food companies, the big agricultural companies, the uh, fossil fuel companies, the gun manufacturers, and of course the defense contractors. That's the tyranny that we need to be overthrowing. So everything is so backwards. Um, and of course, people who say that are considered what, too far left by the democratic elite? They, the democratic elite would not let FDR be, a, be anywhere in the room today. FDR would be considered a wild-eyed radical. So I want to contribute to, to, the converse, to the change in the conversation and the change in the direction of the country, just like everybody else I know, just like you. Um, and how best I might do that, um, I'm figuring out. What are some of the policies that you think that whether you would be running or someone else would be running uh, need to be put into place? Well, obviously, it's ridiculous that we are the only advanced democracy that does not have universal health care, plus China, plus Russia, plus Cuba. It is absolutely absurd that we don't have universal health care. We don't have it because of short-term profit maximization for, uh, for uh, insurance companies. And we have people in medical debt that doesn't even exist in these other countries because of short-term profit for uh, pharmaceutical companies. We have people choosing between their rent and their, and their insulin in this country. In other places, it's free or very, very inexpensive. And right now, you know, the Democrats are all excited because they got insulin down to $35 for, uh, for, for, for people who are Medicare recipients. It should be for everyone. We should completely cancel the college loan debt. You know, I'll tell you something, Katie. I don't think there's ever been any generation in America where government proactively thwarts the dreams of our young the way it is happening today. It's unbelievable. It's like our young people, government should be, this, this is what happens in a system of nature. This is what happens in any advanced mammalian species that survives and thrives. You try to help your young get ahead. You help the cubs, you help the young. There's no protection. There's a fuck you to America's young that comes out of officialdom today. Mm -hmm. It's not just selfish. It is, it is not just dysfunctional. It is un-American, it is pathological, it's sociopathic, all the words we could come up with. So, of course, we should cancel that college loan debt. Of course, higher education and trade school should be, uh, should be uh, free or extremely affordable. Of course, we should repeal that 2017 tax cut, $2 trillion tax cut, where 83% of every dollar went to the highest uh, earners and corporations. We should put back in the, med uh, the uh, middle class tax cuts, of course. We should stop these corporate subsidies. We should have a wealth tax. We should have a, right now, with inflation being the way it is, not only the windfall profits tax, we should have some price controls. We should, we should take Seriously, the idea of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, rather than a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. So the, it's not, you know, it's interesting because you ask what policies, it, we all know what the policies are. And all of the policies that I just mentioned are, most of them are policies that are majorly fundamentally supported by the majority of people. But right. now we have, as we know, our representative government is not working. Washington is a system of legalized bribery. And our representatives do more to represent the will of their donors than the will of their constituents. And then in the absence of, you know, with the gerrymandering being the way it is, how do we break that? We, we, the only way we can break that is with a massive movement. 
That's what we need, a massive movement. And Democrats have to stop their codependent relationship with the DNC. It's unbelievable. The Republicans don't have that codependent relationship with the RNC. Yeah. You know, the RNC said, well, you can have you can have Jeb Bush or you can have Marco Rubio. Or you could have John Kasich. And they went, fuck you. You're just our administrative office. And we want Donald Trump. But the Democrats, oh, whatever the DNC says. We know what the DNC did to, did to Bernie in 2016. And in 2016, the rage of people at this massive transfer of power, at the fact that their communities had been ravaged, at the fact that they that their opportunities in life were just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking in the workplace and everywhere else. And Bernie, all the polls showed, if the, if the DNC had just left their fingers off the scale, I don't know if Hillary would have won or Bernie would have won, in the primaries, but I'll tell you, Donald Trump would never have been president. And then the DNC did it again in 20. And what we, that's what I would like to see more than anything else at the end of this. The DNC, the establishment democratic leadership, even if we pull out a win in the Senate tonight, even if miraculously we pull out a win in both houses, it's still a spectacular failure. The very fact it was even this close. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a change in the consciousness of enough is enough. With these people, we keep giving another chance. So, I mean, Nancy Pelosi has been through a terrible tragedy, and I respect that. If she had not, of course, we're all very sorry about that. If it were not for that, I'd be saying tonight the best thing that could happen is for her to resign tomorrow. If the Democratic, we, we just need, there is a whole level of leadership that just needs out, out, out. And if it were the Republican Party, they would be, interestingly enough. So I, I want to be a voice in whatever way would be helpful to making that change happen so we can begin a real season of repair and a real season of renewal in this country. So however my, whatever I can be, however I can be helpful is what I'm going to do. And why do you say that about Pelosi? I mean, let's, I think you can say that you're sorry for what happened, but policy wise, why do you think she should? Why don't we have... I mean, everything that the that the establishment Democratic leadership stands for. I understand what happened with the Build Back Better bill, but Nancy actually Nancy actually led the promising. Oh, we can we can make it into two bills and it'll be fine. She actually was the leading of that call. You could almost see what happened when AOC first went and Ilan Omar and the squad and all those people first got there. You know. Katie, I wasn't there, but you could almost feel it in the air. Couldn't you just feel it how Nancy just probably gave them her cell phone number and said, honey, look, I'm just like you. We want the same thing. Here's my number. Call me anytime. You just stay with me and um, we're going to get this done. I mean, couldn't you just feel it? That's why the whole force the vote thing was happening. It was like, no, don't. These, these people walked in. They just got under her spell, under her sway. How? Mama bear, mama bear. Yeah, and every, so. every, yeah, but it wasn't mama bear, really. It was more like the lover who has been disloyal so many times and still comes back. Come on, baby, give me another chance. These people should not be given another chance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, Nancy needs to, to go home. Yeah. And right now, you know, this is such a terrible thing that's happened. I right. Don't yeah. We'll give her a couple of days. Then we'll re re renew this call. Yeah. Mama bear who ends up eating most of her cubs. That's no, mama good. bear we like. Mama bear. In every advanced mammalian species that survives and thrives, a common characteristic is the fierce behavior of the adult female of the species when she senses a threat to her cubs. And that's true of tigers. It's true of lions. It's true of bears. So you really have to ask yourself about the human species. The 12,000 children starving on this planet every day, the level we have millions of hungry children. We don't have starvation, thank God, in the United States. We have serious hunger. We have millions of American children who go to school hungry every day. We have states like North Carolina who are now saying that if the parents don't pay the bill, we're, they're just not going to feed the kids. They won't feed the kids. And if we don't stand up for that, what, there, what is wrong with us that there's not this overwhelming vote tonight in favor of doing whatever it would take to feed our children, to protect our children? That theoretically 
is the sign of a species that has no intent to survive. Do you know among the hyenas, adult female hyenas encircle their babies while they're feeding and will not let the adult males get anywhere near the food until the babies have been fed. Now, surely the women of America could do better than the hyenas. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Life hacks from hyenas. Hyena <laughs> life hacks, yeah. And Marianne, uh, two more things I want to ask you about. One is, uh, have you been able to reach people on Julian Assange at all? Have you been able to, because he's been, he's such a, um, I know he's someone who, is, his case is very important to yours. Mm -hmm. uh, and to you, excuse me. And he's seen as such a pariah. And I was just wondering if you had any luck talking yeah. to people, reaching people yeah. on that. And yeah. then I have another question after, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very sad. Andrew Coburn's been talking about this. He's going to be writing an article. I saw Stella when I was in uh, when I was in London last. Stella uh, Morris is um, yeah, people Stella don't Morris, know that's who's a, uh, a wonderful Assange's, woman. Uh, wife yeah. and the mother of yeah. his two kids and a lawyer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's a wonderful woman. And uh, their work at the moment, their focus is on the British courts and hoping that, the, that they will not expedite. But you're right, here it's just absurd the lack of support he gets among people who should be afraid. They should be very, very afraid. His case is such an attack on, on the free press. We already have a situation where they have at the, at the Defense Department and at the State Department um, these press briefings, right? So our ideas, the, the current state of the media in the United States today is that journalists who should be covering the Defense Department and should be covering the State Department take notes and they just, they just regurgitate what they were told by the right. spokesman yeah, at the State sure. Department yeah. or the spokesman at the Defense Department. And, and, if they, and, if, and so that's how afraid they already are. And they're not just afraid of being thrown in jail. They're afraid of losing their, their job with that corporate-owned media conglomerate, right? But once they, God forbid, they bring uh, Julian Assange over here and put Assange in jail, it will have such a chilling effect. It will have such a chilling effect on press in this country, which is already in such a terrible state, which is why you guys and all other independent media are so important. Somebody's got to tell it like it is. And even what, when you even when you and I disagree. Yeah, right. Which we do. Yeah. What about um, uh, what was it like meeting Stella? Oh, I love her. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. But of course, she's you know, I have tremendous admiration for her and I have such admiration for her because on one hand, she's in love with this man. She's mother of his two children and she feels the injustice of it. You know, the, 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 she met him because she was a lawyer on his right. team, right? So she has this deep sense of the injustice added to the fact that she loves him and she's watching what's happening to him. And yet, when you see her in interview after interview, she's so sophisticated yeah. and so calm and so elegant. Um, I watched her on Pierce Morgan on an interview where uh, John Bolton was on and John Bolton was so snarky and condescending and rude to her. And she was just so she's a class. She's, yeah. she's not just a class act. She's a brilliant class act. I learned a lot from watching her. So on one hand, you know, I, I just love her as a, as a friend, as a, as a, as a, as a woman. Um, but in addition to that, I have great admiration for her. And when I saw her in London, I, I told her that, in my opinion, she's just pitch perfect. Mm. But yeah. she's, you know, they consider the United, I mean, for whatever reason, we can't get through the wall of resistance on this here. Yeah. But it doesn't matter right now here so much. What matters is, is uh, Britain. Yeah. And can you tell people about uh, how and why you went to Vietnam? <laughs> oh. My father was like a cross between William Kunstler and Zorba the Greek. So I feel like I've told this story so many times, but um, I was in the seventh grade and I came home and I was at dinner and I was explaining to my parents what I learned in school that day. My father used to say, we used to come home and at dinner, my father would say, did they try to teach you any facts today, kids? Well, he said, he said, remember the Byzantine rule. It's never what you think it is. So, so that night I was explaining to my parents 
about the domino theory. And I was explaining to my parents that according to my teacher, if we didn't fight the, um, uh, the communists in Vietnam, we would be fighting them on the shores of Hawaii. And the whole time I'm talking, I'm watching my mother going, my mother is going like, I could just see her hand like, this is not going to go well. And I didn't understand what I was saying. That was like, I thought, this is what right. I learned in school today. And my mother's like, like this. And my father's just turning white, you know. And then at a certain point, he said, that's enough. And he stood up and he said, sweetheart. That's what he called my mother. Get the visas. We're going to Vietnam. And my mother says, oh, Sam. And my father started talking about how the military industrial complex was trying to eat his children's brain and he would not allow it to happen. And if you knew my father, if my father said to my mother, get the visas, we're going to Vietnam, we go to Vietnam. So how long were you there? Oh, I'm sure a few days in Saigon. At that point, the, you, could, you could be in Saigon still, but the fighting was raging about five miles out. I remember how the plane landed you know, so steeply. But it was enough that my father, you know, I remember his saying, what is this, kids? Bullet holes, daddy? Who put them there? U.S. government? God damn, U.S. government. But don't get me wrong, my father was, uh, it was so different then. We had an American flag waving on the front, oh, really? you funny. know, on the front yard. He was, you know, I've, I've said to many people, and I've heard people say that that's true for them as well. I've said in the last few years that I'm really glad that my parents did not live to see what's happening now. It would have broken his heart. It would have broken his heart. But my brother and I like to think we're doing what we can to you know, my father was an immigration lawyer, and my brother is an immigration lawyer. That Texas, that's the Texas I grew up in. And that Texas is there. You know, Jim Hightower, Ramsey Clark, Barbara yeah. Jordan. Um, you know, that's the, that's the Democratic, that's the Texas that I grew up in. Hmm. But we went a lot of places. We was I we were behind the Iron Curtain. I was uh, uh, I was in Russia when I was in chi a child. I was in Finland. I was in Hungary, um, and it, it affected me tremendously. You know, people would say to my father, "Why are you taking your kids to travel all these places? Um, they're so young they won't even remember it." And he would always say, "It will get under their skin." And it did. I mean, there's a certain level of propaganda that I don't think my brother, my sister, and I were ever vulnerable to. And this is true of anybody who travels the world as a child. This idea of American exceptionalism and that America's better and you just can't buy it if you've traveled all over the world and seen not only the people are the same everywhere, but how in some places they were actually nicer to you than they were here. You know, yeah. like the Russian people love children. I don't know if this is still the way it is, but when I was a a child, the Russians would just make such a big deal over a child. So that was my experience. Right. Hmm. Interesting. I like, I didn't realize you traveled to so many different countries. Oh, all over the world. My parents were all, literally all over the world. Hmm. And one of the things, yeah, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, yeah. Mary, I was just wondering, you're telling so many interesting stories. I'm wondering, what's the next book you're working on? Well, I just finished the book about Jesus, actually. It's called The, Mystical Je the Mystic Jesus, The Psychology of Faith. So I went back to my, you know, I go back and forth between my spiritual writing and my political. I was, before I ran for president, I was supposed to be writing this book about, about Jesus because I had gotten a call from a publisher who who is my publisher, but also is the biggest Bible publisher in, in um, the world. And they said the biggest religious denomination, well, first of all, the biggest religious group in the, in the world, uh, in America, I don't know about the world, but in the United States right now, is called none. People who, it's kind of like in politics, the biggest growing group is independent. Right. The biggest growing group in, in, of people in, in religious circles is people who want to know about Jesus, but don't want to have to necessarily be Christian. They want to know about Jesus, but they don't want the dogma or the doctrine of the Christian religion. And he said, they said, could you write a book about that? I said, yeah, actually, because I'm a student of the Course in Miracles, which is um, a Christ-centered teaching. But those traditional Christian terms 
are used in very non-traditional, non-religious psychotherapeutic ways. I'm Jewish and being a student of the Course in Miracles never in any way made me feel I shouldn't be Jewish or that I should be another religion. Um, at the highest, at the peak, religion and psychotherapy are their same thing, are the same thing. They're the healing of the mind. So I was supposed to write that book when I decided to run for president and I said to the publisher, I'm gonna run for president, so maybe not that book right now. They said, okay, what would you like to write? I said, well, if I run for president, I wanna write a book about what I'm standing for, which is what every candidate does. You know, every candidate does, and they should do that. You write a book explaining the issues that you care about, what your agenda would be, and that's what that book was, A Politics of Love. But then I came back to writing the book that um, I was already planning to write, so that will be coming out next year. Wow. I, I You're like, going to have I me like on Jesus. to talk about that? Yeah, I later? really like Jesus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a Jew. For, I'm like I'm not a. I sometimes say I'm a Jew for Jesus. Not like well, the, no, don't like say that. People. But that, that's a born again Christian. Yeah, yeah, like no, group. Not that, yeah. But it is true. You know, I say to people all the time, Jews have a problem with Chris, with Christianity. They don't have a problem with Jesus. I mean, can you blame them? It's a very different thing. Yeah. Uh, Jesus was a Jew. He was one of us. He was. Um... Yeah, you're welcome, Christians. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds good. I'm. I'm. I'll totally have you on to talk about that. And I will read it. Thank you. Yeah. September 23, 2023. Oh, okay. Great. Anything else you want to uh, let people know about or any final words from you or from Leslie? I just want to say thank you so much for having me on, Kay, and so nice to talk to you again, Marion. Oh, it's really nice to see you, Leslie. Thank you. I think we're all going to need a lot of courage in the days ahead. That's what I think. I think that what's going to be happening for all of us politically in this country, I think that it's qualities of personhood that are going to determine where we go now. Um, and I think we're all going to have to be willing to go through some changes within ourselves in order to create the kinds of changes we need to create on the outside. Okay. Great. Exciting. You Daunting. Think so? Daunting and exciting, yeah. For yeah. this we were born. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I will uh, talk to you guys again soon. Thank you. Nice Thank seeing you, know. Leslie. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, that was great. We have more uh, guests coming up. Very excited. And again, thank you so much for watching, for tuning in. Um, we are going to be, we're going to be joined shortly by some more guests. I uh, just want to encourage people to like the stream if they haven't already. Also to, um, they can become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. They can support Useful Idiots and get access to more content at um, usefulidiots.substack.com. And um, let's see, we're going to play the, uh, you know what, let's take a minute. We're going to play the the intro that Brad made to this uh, to this uh, episode. And then we're going to bring in our, our next guest. And I know you guys are very excited to hear from him. Also, everyone like the chat. Everyone like the chat. Okay. This okay, that was the the very scary clip intro that I missed the first time and some people also missed it. So uh, we just played it for you again. Now we're going to bring in our next guest. This guy you guys are very excited about. It's kind of annoying, honestly, if I'm being honest, uh, how excited you were about it uh, while other guests were on. But I understand because he's an exciting guest and he is none other than Matthew Taibbi. Hi, Matt. Hey, Katie, what's going on? How's it going? All right, although I'm, I'm more 
inebriated that I am informed. Oh, really? Okay, good. Well, I'm, you know what? We can, we, ha, what have you been drinking at? Was there a lot of democracies on the line? Can uh, we review your drinking game again? Yeah, there was a lot of democracy itself. There was a lot of election deniers. There was a lot of, uh, yeah. So, so let, the, the rules were, uh, let me open this back up for you, for people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so rule number one was any mention of like democracy being on the ballot. Um, most important election of our lifetime that actually didn't come up at all. Wow. Uh, Steve Kornacki drawing frenzied shapes around Pennsylvania. Um, that came up once. Uh, I haven't seen John Fetterman shorts on video all night. That was another one of the rules. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, lots of election deniers stuff. Uh, that was one of the rules. Uh, conditions ripe for violence. That came up a couple of times. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, we haven't gotten to Nazis, fascists, or white supremacy yet because nobody has, because we haven't we haven't reached the point of it being fully clear who's who's actually going right. to take control of whatever. Got um, it. Mm -hmm. All right. And what about the MSNBC rules? Have you so, played those? Like, yeah. So let, uh, I can just review who I guessed for. for okay. Each one of yeah. These. So right. I, I guess I guess that it would be um, that it would be uh, Alex Wagner or or I'm sorry I guess that it would be O'Donnell who would blame the uh, disobedient Democrats for the loss, but that's going to be later in the evening, obviously. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be Joy Reid who's going to make the bad sports joke about Herschel Walker. Uh, she did use the term sui generis earlier this huh. evening, which I thought was bold by her. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, nobody has got, has, has conveyed the, um, the mis. well, actually Rachel did, did go for the whole misinformation, disinformation, malinformation thing. Okay. Um, but she didn't directly reference the FBI or, or the National Counterterrorism Center. I, I called that a drink anyway. Okay. Um, I guess that was going to be her. I, I actually, I guess that was going to be Nicole Wallace who was going to do that. Um, I, I figured it would be Hayes who would be the first to invoke Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, that hasn't come up yet. It hasn't happened yet. Okay. Yeah. And then um, for the, 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 the number 15 was it's basically like you know how you know how you count cards in 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 blackjack no remind so, me so basically whenever you see a face card you like add and whenever you see like a low card you subtract and the whole idea is the deck is hot if you're if you're in the plus category okay. and it's cold if it's in if it's in the minus category so the whole the idea was to take, keep a running count of whether they mentioned Trump more than all other issues combined. Right. On MSNBC, and it the deck was so hot that uh, that basically you could drink an unlimited amount just on this question. Right. Because all they did was talk about Trump. Trump, yeah. Uh, but but that's in the context of being excited that Trump is kind of it's not a good night for Trump. It's a good night for DeSantis. So right. Or as oh, Trump uh, likes to call him, Ron DeSanctimonious. <laughs> Does he really call him? Oh that? yeah, you didn't hear. Yeah, he was he was reading a a, a poll. We covered this on Monday morning. Yeah, he's like, oh look at that, look at look at me, seventy percent, and there I am, and then Cheney, no, and Ron DeSanctimonious. Yeah. Wow, he can pronounce. Yeah, as Brad was saying, it must be from uh, Oliver uh, from Roger Stone. <laughs> right exactly yeah, yeah uh that's that's pretty impressive Happy yeah i know uh, well, although, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah keep going sorry no uh, so what are your what are your early impressions because the, the, it, it's impossible to tell anything at this stage already yeah i know i uh uh i thought uh it looked like herschel walker was gonna win which would have been funny but i guess he's not gonna win um, uh well or is it too close to call it's too close to call, and, and either way, they're probably not going to get to fifty. 
Okay. Wow. So it's going to be a runoff and everybody's going to be stoked about that. And we're going right. to be waiting, waiting for another month to figure out. Um, but that, but that depends on, uh, uh, there's a, there's a whole slew of other races that. Yeah. What um, are you excited are, about or not excited about? Well, I'm a little surprised at, um, at, uh, uh, um, Fetterman doing as well as he has. Uh, but then it, uh, my guess is Nevada, uh, Ohio, um, and, you know, Nevada and Ohio are going, are going to cancel out Pennsylvania and that that would give it to the, Dem to the Republicans irrespective of Georgia. That's, that's sort of where, where I'm, I'm guessing at this point. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know, honestly. Uh, I, 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 I'm just, I'd be lying if I said I had any special insight into it. Mm. Mm. Well, this is a new problem of like modern age election coverage is that the states all have different reporting methods. They're all clearly, clearly uh, telling you the, the, the well, some of the states anyway are clearly dumping huge masses of mail-in votes at the early stages of the reporting process. So you tune in and you see you like results like Oz up, I mean, sorry, Fetterman up 90 right. to 8 or whatever it is. And then you look up two hours later and it's, you know, 53 to 43. Um, same thing happened in Ohio. So I don't know. Who, who the hell knows? Right now... Right now, it looks like Walker's up in Ohio. Um, but what does that mean? You yeah. Know? Who the hell knows? It's so depressing. All all of um, all of uh, Monday morning was you know Sunday morning news shows. It was just all horse race. Like no other news mattered at all. Oh, did, are you frozen? Uh, Wilson, are you here, by the way? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I want to make sure you and Taibi saw each other. Um, but Taibi seems to be frozen. I was going to say, Wilson, you should play some clips for us. Let's see, is is, is Taibi still frozen? Uh, well, I believe he is, but let's let's uh, bring well, in another guest. When here. God freezes one useful idiot's host, he melts another. So we're going to bring in another guest, and then... Taibi, if you're there, maybe reconnect. But we got Aaron Mata here. Hello, Aaron. Aaron. Hey. How's it going? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. How are you doing? All I care about is I really don't want to hear Georgia on my mind. My mind, yeah. For the next month on loop. That's all I care about. Yeah. I don't want to hear that song. Because remember last time in the 2020 race, there also was a runoff. So we heard for... Right. Like nonstop every single day, Georgia on my mind. Yep, a lot of Georgia. So oh. you're saying Georgia on my mind is on your mind? Yes, Georgia on my mind is on my mind. <laughs> Terrible. Well, we're and we got Taibi back. Hey, hey what's up, Aaron? Hey, what's up, Matt? How are you doing, man? How's your night going? Uh, I'm a little tipsy. Yeah. You know, honestly, uh, and I should I play this one more time with you. Yeah, that's you a great com. That's a, you see, most people don't admit that that combination. Yeah, well, uh, being tipsy yeah, and not knowing anything. Most people pretend they're not drunk and pretend that they do know everything. Look, look, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention names, but I was watching a lot of cable tonight, and I, I look as as a career drug user, I, I identified, I would say a half dozen people who are clearly cranked on something tonight. Really? Uh, and and you know, a lot of sniffling going on, uh, on those sets. We should do a game where you have to match the person to the substance. Uh, uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't make sense of it. It's, look, the, the, the obvious early conclusion is that 
you know, Republicans are going to win the House, but, you know, maybe it's not going to be a blowout. And right. then on Senate side, you know, it's kind of a toss up, but they're probably going to win. But I don't know. Do, do you know? I, I, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, I, I was just saying that I just I don't want to hear the song Georgia on my mind again on oh. the next month. You know, oh, that's, God. that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, there, there were, there are probably people who will commit suicide if we, if we end up in that place. Don't you think? Don't do it, guys. Don't let them win. Yeah. Yeah. Don't let the terrorists win. Yeah. Don't I let mean, whoever gets uh, who, who wrote that song. I wonder who gets the royalties from that. I'm pretty sure it's Ray Charles. Yeah, it is. Ray yeah. Charles. Ray I know he performed Fire. it, but I didn't know if he wrote it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, and then of course, you know, there's also Pennsylvania. It, it looks like um, JD Vance is pulling ahead in Ohio. Yeah. That yeah. has that been called? I don't yeah. think it's been called yet, but he looks no. very ahead. Yeah. No. Um, and what's going to happen with, um, with uh, Ted Budd? Is that called yet? Oh, good question. Don't know. Good question. Wilson, you want to give us some footage to look at? Yeah, Matt, uh, I know you've been watching MSNBC tonight. What uh, I got MSNBC, CNN, and Fox. All no, up. you don't. Not just that. You also have the Kornacki cam. We do have the Kornacki cam, too. So we have four one's... choices. So, yeah, what do you yeah. want, Matt? Uh, yeah, well, let's go for Kornacki. Kornacki was, was, he, he was, he was a bundle of energy tonight. I mean, he still is. Uh... <laughs> Poor guy. Poor guy. <laughs> I mean, look, first of all, they've made him wear that same costume for years yeah. years on end now, right? And his kids are going to be born in that costume. <laughs> the know? khaki pants? Yeah, the, the, the khaki yeah. pants, the tie. White, the, the white uh, shirt. It's it's one and a half inches below his belt line. The belt right. is like a little bit low. It's a good costume. I'm not gonna lie. It, look, it's 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 good staging, but still, I don't know. I, and I feel standing awkward. the whole time, always standing. He doesn't get to sit. I feel yeah. awkward watching Steve Kornacki. I feel like he's fetishized. They have a camera on him, even when I know. He's, even when he's not talking, they have the camera on him. Like I know, it's like he's right. right. No privacy. Yeah. No yeah, it, agency. It, it, it's a sex cam, right? Yeah. yeah. You know how like there, you know, she, uh, there's there's like the girl who's in the room, and you know you can't see the bars, right? Uh, but she's like flipping through a magazine or something like that. That's what they do during the commercial break. They have a camera on him where he's like trying to figure shit out and stuff. Right. I don't know. It's, it's really it's it's, it's only fans. It's only fans for cable news. That's what it is. Right. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> It's asexual sex cam. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, he has two yes. two um packs on his back. Yeah, 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 yeah. For yeah, the, yeah. For yeah, the them up. Why two? Uh, one well, a backup in case he loses power in one. One is his alien commander. Yeah. You know, what I mean, that? the thing, the, the indignities he's got to put up with two There's battery, two, two microphone batter battery yeah. packs, and yeah, and then they're they're they have a they're pick like. His back is turned to us, but we're all still watching him. Like, yeah. Imagine if you had to go to work, and you're, you know, people are watching you. People are watching you. Like, people are watching you as you're just working with your back to the camera. It's just the indignity. I yeah, would. Think, uh, yeah, yeah. I would think about nothing about what my ass looks like on camera. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, wow. But uh, look, he's doing a good job. Like he's he's trying to point out. He, he, he's he's on the knife edge of like what his assignment is because on the one hand he's he's uh trying to like keep everybody on set feeling positive yeah. so he's giving them good news about certain districts and everything like that but he is taking time out to like point out to, to point out that a lot of these votes are mail-in votes i should have made mail-in vote one of the rules because oh. he said that about five thousand times tonight <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, but no, it's funny. This is this is some funny stuff. Um, but you but but again, it's ten nineteen, and we don't have a we don't have a freaking clue about anything. Right. No, right? No, nothing, nothing. And I know that in Pennsylvania they extended the polls because they lacked paper ballots in a couple of places. So Pennsylvania, especially, I think, will be the late one. Ugh. By the way, you know, I heard, uh, and this just this could be totally false, but. A source of mine at MSNBC told me that Karnacki was secretly anti-Russiagate, that he was not down with the whole Russiagate thing. 
have you not had him on the show yet? Well, first of all, I mean, you know, even if he did feel that way, he can never talk right. to me because yeah, exactly, you know, yeah. that blows cover. But yeah, totally, that's what I heard. Yeah. That's wow. what I was yeah, yeah, yeah. They would they would bring him up to like the twenty eighth floor of Thirty Rock and yeah. like, and just bang his balls with a ball peen hammer, you know. Like, I mean, he, he's been through enough. He's already been through enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, yes, Dan Quarterman, I am drinking white Russians. That is that is my, my <laughs> wow, that's a very nice. filling drink. Yeah. Right? Yeah, is that so you don't drink too much? Uh no, it's actually so that I drink more. There's a lot of vodka in this thing, actually. Uh, oh, okay. White Russians are great. They are great. But they're, they're very they're, filling. They're very filling and and they're deceptive because they taste good and the milk kind of like makes you think you're having a shake. Right, but it's it's really it's really pretty bad for you. Um, so yeah, the dude abides. Uh, right. So what do we what do we have going on here? I mean, like, well, uh, yeah, I'm, should we I'm, watch I'm, some stuff? Should we watch some MSNBC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, MSNBC, if you haven't yeah. played that clip, okay. Oh, what what, what clip? Yeah. Well, no, the not Kornacki, that, but the actual MSNBC. Okay, let's yeah, hear well, what Rachel Matt, said. Yeah. Matt tweeted a clip earlier of Dana oh, yeah. Bash. So that was so funny. I, I do okay. think we should talk about that sure. one eventually. But sure, but let's. Let's listen to Rachel with them. Um, and Bo Hines is the Republican candidate in North Carolina 13. More than anybody else, I think, who is a new candidate, I think Bo Hines is a contender to join the Matt Gates, Bobert, Marjorie Taylor Greene caucus. How is he doing in NC 13? Yeah, so you can you can see it right here. This is about 75 percent of the voting. Oh, right this now. is the same He's thing, but not from the cam. Against his Democratic opponents, the difference there of just about 13,000 votes. Hines needs to be running. Trump lost. Hines is behind. This is what this was. This was Ted Budd district that got you know, Ted Budd running for the Senate got dramatically redrawn. It went from being a, a core Republican district to one that Biden under these new lines actually would have carried by two points. So again, if you just follow that rule through the, you know, that, uh, that math rule there, Hines needs to be running a couple points ahead of Trump in the counties in the district here. And you just, you know, take a look at it right here. Uh, he is out here in Wayne County, right? Uh, he is not in Johnston County, Johnston County is a big one. This is right outside of Raleigh here. He's not running uh, ahead of the Trump number at all there. And he's two points ahead of it and he's all in in Harnett County. So this is, and then you start getting into, this is where Democrats have their best chance here to, to get this seat. Wake County, you still got a lot of vote to come in Wake County. And you, you could look at that. It's already better than a two to one advantage, you know, for Wiley Nickel here. And what's to, you know, this is same day vote, but in a core Democratic county. So again, this is an opportunity here. On, why, why I mentioned the Ted Budd piece of it is that if Wiley Nickel wins this mathematically in terms of, you know, again, the, the sort of the accounting, balancing the ledgers for control of the House. This Isn't would Ted Budd an awesome right? name for? For, gain, for a, like a, a senator with a drug seat. problem, by the way. Yeah. It's like smoking yeah. McPot. It's like... A new call, actually, in the... Oh, here we go. Dun, 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 dun. NBC News can now project that the Republican incumbent governor of Iowa, Kim Reynolds, uh, has defeated her Democratic challenger, and Kim Reynolds will be re-elected as Iowa's Republican governor. You guys, what... Steve well, was just uh, saying uh, there about those house races. I mean, and Lawrence talked about the history of midterms. So a incumbent president's party takes a, I mean, I think Bob Nicole used Wallace the word whooping. She's I just think scary to me. She's the word something. Yeah. Shellacking. <laughs> Shellacking. Right. I mean, no one has mentioned President Joe Biden yet, but the Democrats who ran on infrastructure um, seem to be Remember doing she worked for very, Bush? very well. This is not oh, yeah. the night Republicans thought they were going mean, to. This, uh, this comment, let me just reserve space for this comment. Maybe to <laughs> Hold the space. The proof of it, but Joe Biden is on the verge of being the most successful Democratic president <laughs> in a midterm right. election that we have seen in quite some time. Oh, it's what are you early, talking it's about? Early in the night. <laughs> okay. It uh, is early in the night. Wow. wow. Rachel Maddow. Uh, uh, yeah. That's crazy. How Lawrence oh, was being shit. too partisan Walker. for Rachel Maddow. Walkers. Look like they run some pretty good candidates. Yeah. Sherry Beasley. Sorry. Someone who has not been seen as a national figure, there's not been a lot of attention or resources devoted to that, running but a tight race losing. in North Carolina. Tim Ryan in this a state close. where Trump won eight points, running a tight race in Ohio. I mean, and let's not forget, Wes Moore, right? Oh, Mandela right. 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 Running a tight race in Ohio. Wait, pause it. Wait, Wilson, uh, pause it for a second. To be elected as a governor. Yeah. We 
Are we watching the same uh, race? She said, you know, she said, yeah, I know. She says it's tight and it shows the seven numbers. Points. She said seven points. Yeah. I, it's just, uh, it's just crazy. And it's, they're just adjusting you know, the standards, right? Oh, well, we got the sock. We got to hear the socky bomb. Oh, oh, the socky bomb yeah. is amazing. Let's hear what she That was what we were all thinking when Steve just surprised us with that news about Lauren Boebert in her home district. I know, look, this is my dad's district in Colorado, and I think we all have these family members who watch MSNBC and they think they're political experts, and he's been telling me about Adam Frisch for months. He's been telling me, this guy, he's really smart, he's really good, he could beat Lauren Boebert, and here we are. And this is the kind of conversation that you have when you're the party that is actually going to win a lot of seats. People who nobody, most people, aside from my dad, have never really heard of, Adam Frisch, I mean, he is sur surpassing expectations. So that's the kind of thing happening right now, um, which is pretty remarkable. I, I will say, Rachel, though, that there are also races that we're talking about that could go the other way, right? That shouldn't because they are in Democratic districts. The night is young. But man, Adam Frisch has my has my uh, award right now for the surprise conversation we're having tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, I will say we oh, just had him on the on the show a couple of weeks ago. We had him on my show a couple of weeks She's ago. She's trying to take what credit. He said was smart. And I grew up in Colorado, so Colorado yeah. is a very normy state. You know, it's she not the show. He's doing well. out yeah. as the kind of politician she is. She fit in probably in Florida. Walker jumping she ahead a little more. Colorado scary. They tend to like Republicans who are normy. Republicans there tend to be great <laughs> yeah. for environment. There's been some yeah. hard normy even me. Is that a thing? thing? Jen Saki looks a little tipsy. Colorado that's mm -hmm. super evangelical and Lauren Boebert. Yeah, and, and a it's a district. But Frisch is a normal. I bet she started drinking the minute she left. I'm getting right. Um, she, we know she likes margaritas so watching Kornacki and, and they're watching these margins and what they're seeing in the margins has them very optimistic about about Fetterman I like the nod optimistic about New Hampshire. Yeah. what do you see in the margins that, that that puts some of these new conversations on you the know who is really good at the nod uh, the shank of the night the, shank of the, the guy night. used to be on Dateline I think um, I'm hearing a lot about Pennsylvania and Philly who am I thinking turn of? out really Stone well Phillips. good for Democrats. Who? And that is a place Remember really Stone Phillips? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was really good at the night. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Fetterman. Yeah, but that's too, it's too early. It's a little early, and that race started off. Very heavily for Democrats. No surprise. That given it started that off. Uh, it, it's been moving toward Oz all night. Oh, but we don't know. What is also interesting right. in Pennsylvania, Nicole, on the other side of it, is that Dr. Oz, uh, he really needed to run up or. I think Oz is going to lose, but yeah. Side of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Oh, Fetterman is down now below fifty-one percent. So wow. Who knows? You know. Somewhere. And those are where the rural votes are, more Republican votes, more reliable Trump voters or people who may not even like Oz, but feel like we Sarah want Hook to be Sanders win. winning and makes me laugh a little bit. So mm -hmm. come on. First female governor, right, of Arkansas. Because it is yeah. Like yeah. Where, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fetterman's yeah. debate performance is bringing him down. There's really not a lot of evidence that, of that at all. And mm -hmm. Democrats uh, are very, very excited and energized let's in see. Pennsylvania. Are you really seeing so, that today and also in the mail-in numbers? We're going to go to Steve in just a minute minute or two um, to put some meat on those bones in terms of what, mm -hmm. Jen, you are hearing out of Pennsylvania and what we are seeing. Again, objectifying Steve. I know. Put some meat bones. on the bones. Yeah, God. She's body shaming him? <laughs> yeah, there is a little bit of that, isn't there? Yeah. Better, better work didn't pull it out. Shocker. Yeah. Pretty not close. I, I tweeted that uh, Better Work is now, is now going to raise $900 million to go run for the the head of the EU. Interesting. Uh, that would be good. Right? I mean, is there what other scam is there for this guy to run? He's, yeah. he's, he's raised more more money in a losing effort than any other candidate in history. Maybe he and Stacey Aberman could like create a new country. Oh, that would be great. A new state. Yeah, what would they call it? Call it, call it consultistan. Just yeah. like we're consultants. Oh, consultants. <laughs> What uh, uh, Adolf Reed has a name for that. What does he call them? Like almost, almost victors, never victors. 
Israel. She was one of those. Right? These guys who like are never going to win, but they just pitch themselves as doing really well and overcoming odds. And, right. and they raise so much money and yeah. consultants make a killing off of them. Yeah. Consultants, Dan, would be great. Where, where would they put it? What country could we replace? <laughs> Another stand, maybe. Those countries are too interesting, though, like all of them. Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan. Yeah. Well, Turkmenistan, none of them would ever go there because it's too dangerous. Right. Uh, no, no, we we need we need to replace another country like like uh, Luxembourg. Like, yeah, Luxembourg, Denmark, maybe. I mean, I got nothing against Denmark, but yeah, I like that show. Um, like, Gordon, Gorgon comes in and rams it through. And Republicans like it. Rams it through. She looks a little it is so fatigued, fun, why, um, drunk, yeah. has a cold. There's something going on. Yeah. I mean, I should speak. I, I have a bit of a cold. So. Abigail Spanberger is perennially the person we look to as the bellwether. Yeah. But what's going on with Spanberger, by the way? That's a, that's a key, kind of a key race. She is the canary in the coal mine in a lot of ways. Yeah, what is? I think she's ahead, she's but it's great close. Candidate, great campaigner. Uh, let me look. Hang on a minute. We have a change in characterization in an important Senate race. The Ohio Senate race. This has previously been characterized by NBC News as too early to call. It is still too early to call, but NBC News now says wow. that Republican candidate J.D. Vance is leading in this Ohio Senate race. We're going to be getting more information about that. We're also going to be taking a quick break right now because when we come back, we're going to be getting a... Oh, 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 sorry, uh, we have another call. I, I hereby interrupt myself to tell you that there is oh, a wow. projection in the Pennsylvania governor's race. Democrat Josh Shapiro is the projected winner wow. against Republican candidate Doug Mastriano. Which means that the wow. Dems are going to uh, keep doing that Pied again, Piper thing because they got him in. have a characterization of a, of, a, of a winner, let alone a leader even, um, in the Senate race. But in this governor's race... That's sort of good news, right? He's projected the winner. Yeah, Mastriano is kind of scary. Versus Doug Mastriano was one of the starkest... Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean... I will say the Wisconsin races, the, both yes. the governor's race and the yeah. Senate race in Wisconsin are very, very stark contrast between those candidates. But the Pennsylvania governor's race with Doug Mastriano and Josh Shapiro, it was harder to get two candidates who offered different, different yeah. visions for the state that were more different than the two. Sandberger is now winning. And the secretary of state. She is, right? The governor appoints yeah. the secretary of state. And what was going to happen in Pennsylvania uh, with Mastriano was one of those issues that, that one of those possibilities that's, that made Joe uh, Biden say democracy little, is on the ballot. That's, that's interesting. Democracy on the ballot. Uh, drink, 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 on drink. Extremism and abortion. <laughs> and he tied it all together in one of the most powerful speeches of the midterm Saturday night in Philadelphia uh, um, in, a, in that, uh, that big event with President Biden and President Obama. But he ran on abortion. He, he also was the target of anti Semitic attacks mm -hmm. on a daily basis. All right, Mandela Barnes is, is dropping. Quickly. Sort of the center of oh, the extremist yeah. really excited. Uh, movement running against it. This has Compton, to do with where, where the early voting was. Very, very yeah. Josh and by the way, Josh appeared for two, two things. One thing is his margin. If his margin stays looking like that, yes. this yeah. is not a state where you're necessarily going to see people ticket split. There isn't, you can kind of see there might be. It's windy at Fox uh, News. We can go there. But also vote for Warnock. It's hard to imagine a ticket splitting voter in Pennsylvania. The other thing, voters. But then you go to uh, the 15 rural counties, and that is where Republican challenger Adam Laxalt, he has really put his focus, hoping that high turnout in the way her helped offset losses in Washington. <laughs> And is that for her mic? Why is she doing that? Fascinating coming out of Washoe County. Um, those vote totals. Looks are, like she's holding up a, like oh, a, when throughout. you drink a. Republicans had outnumbered. Her camera person is a gorilla. It's like a sign language. In Washoe thing. County. So the dependence on those rural counties for Laxalt really not, may not Trouble be as, as large it? as as he had once expected. But we have another issue here when you look at turnout. I mean, we have early voting, Laxalt. but also these mail-in ballots. In this state, you could postmark your mail-in ballot by today. It will still count. Well, or you could have the option to drop it off in person. And in some of those cases, those mail-in ballots will not be counted Barnes, tonight. Uh, it could take up to seven oh, good, days. Okay. Guys. Okay, oh, Alexandra, thanks. thank you so much. We do have a race call to make, and that is in Pennsylvania. Uh, for governor, we can now project that Josh Shapiro, the Democrat, will beat Doug Mastriano. 
Uh, Shapiro, uh, the attorney general, uh, has run a pretty strong race. Uh, he's running well ahead of the Senate candidate there, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman. Uh, we can make this call. There was a concern about uh, Mastriano in and, and Republican circles, but Democrats, remember, spent a lot of money putting yeah. Mastriano uh, supporting the him in the pipers. primary. Can uh, we one just of several talk candidates about a around things? the country that they yeah. did yeah, to let's, Shapiro, let's though, this, uh, this. Uh, to his credit, it, ran yeah. a, a pretty tight race. There, I so, muted. Okay. So the um, the New York Times like needle page, which is where they have uh, sort of their estimates of where everything is going to end up. Um, first of all, it, you know they 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 have like a you know a thirteen like a for sure thirteen seat advantage for. Republicans with 18 toss-ups in the House, so this could either this could either be like a, a, a Clinton level loss, it's not going to be an Obama level loss, or or it could be relatively modest. In the Senate, they've got it 49-49 uh, with two toss-ups, one of those being Nevada. Uh, and it looks like the night nightmare scenario may pan out because Nevada almost certainly, I think, is going to end up being Republican, and then Georgia is going to end up in the runoff. And so we are going to end up waiting till December 6th, absent wow. some nightmare scenario. Uh, Ugh. I was getting so excited to not hear about the midterms anymore. I know. But right? This extends it another month, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, unless unless something unusual happens, but it doesn't look like. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Uh, I, I think that's a solid prediction. Well, well, look, Arizona's early. The, the 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 possibility for this being settled this evening basically rests on Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. Right. And. All of those states are pretty early in their in the in the process, but you know, God, who knows? Wisconsin is still is still looking a little shaky for the Republicans, um, and even the even the House is kind of inching closer towards parity. Mm. So. Mm. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what to think about any of this stuff. It's tough for the Republicans. They should have the advantage, but they they have a split. There's the Trump wing, and like the base worships Trump, but a lot of these politicians, you know, think he's horrible for the party, and they can't defend all the crazy things he says. And so they, I think they, and they, and what do they have to run on? I mean, wh what they have to run on is like. How bad the Democrats are, but sometimes that's not enough. All right. You know? That's what both parties try to run on, how bad the other ones is. Yeah. Are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you would think that they would have uh, been in such a good position. I mean, all Democrats could have talked about for, you know, two years is January 6th and threats to our democracy. You know, uh, the economy is not in great shape. So you, you think Republicans would be in, in a position to take advantage, but they're just. You know, they don't really have that, like they have nothing substantively to tell people. So maybe that will be what does them in tonight or at least doesn't give them the the sweep that they were hoping for. By the way, someone wrote Friar Aaron, which is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, what was that? Why is that? Fun? I, I don't get it. You look like you're like a cappuccino monk or something. <laughs> okay. The yeah, what was that? Movie? It's wearing a hoodie. It's oh, I know what you're talking about. The, the uh, Rose. Name of the Rose. In the name of the rose, is that it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. By Umberto yeah. Echo. Umberto Echo. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you read that book? I tried no, to read I'm that good. book. I tried to read that book three times. Wow. Not good. Unsuccessfully. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Aaron. I think you're right. Like, he, the 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 Senate candidates who are cl the most tied to Trump, um, are struggling. And. <laughs> You know, um, in the two most important states, like Trump picked them, Georgia and Pennsylvania, right? These right. were Trump 
like picks and Herschel, Herschel Walker. It's, I mean, that race is just unbelievable. The things he said yeah. with, and you know, having to say that he was like once mentally ill, but he's not anymore. And then he had the abortion controversy and the sheriff badge. I mean, that was a oh, Trump the sheriff production. badge was so funny. I forgot about that. That was what just happened with the sheriff badge. He brought out that. he he had a badge that was like an honorary, like it was not a real badge. He pretended he like worked in law enforcement. It was for some like appreciate. They gave him like an honorary badge, but. He took it out during a debate and the, and the moderator was like, you can't have props. He's like, it's not prop. It's real. Like, it's real. Like, as if she thought that it was like, yeah, it was very, very funny. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, Trump, that's excellent. And, the, and, you know, and Trump also uh, arguably cost Re Republicans the Senate last time, too. Um, and so he could well do it again. This could be his second spoiler election in a row, which is so funny. There it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> the thing is, I just can't think of Herschel Walker without thinking about how great he was as a running back. I, oh, he was it, so good. He was so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually watching some footage of him the, the other day, and he was incredible. Just as a absolutely. running back? As a running back. It was so good. Oh, it was so unbelievable. Good. The dude just bounced off him. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I made a mistake. On a previous show, I said he was also unstoppable at Tecmo Bowl. That was actually Bo Jackson. Right, right. It was Bo Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah. yeah. Um, but that's why he's the candidate and, and I think Matt's frozen here um, but that that's why Herschel Walker is the candidate is because he played for Trump's football team because Trump owned one of these USFL uh, teams yeah the USFL was, team yeah so that's why he's yeah. in, that's why he's in there <laughs> <laughs> he's so you know um, he's got so many flaws, just to put it nicely, as as a candidate. And and uh, if he can't pull it off, you can blame that on Trump. Well, okay. So what, let's just take a quick look at where he is at the moment. Yeah, where are we at? Uh, where are we at? Let's see. He's the forty nine floor. He's he's a point up on Warnock. Wow. And it's close. It's very close. Uh, so insane. So the thing about that, though, is that it's going to go to a runoff unless he picks up um, another point six at least. Yeah. And uh, okay, Ron Johnson just pulled ahead of Mandela, Mandela Barnes. Uh, um, let's see. Ron Johnson. Um, okay, it's back to two hundred two for the House races for for Democrats. Uh, so Republicans picked up a seat in the House apparently somewhere in the projections. Um, man, there's a lot of close House races. A lot. Um, oh, Arizona is back in the toss-up category. Wasn't the uh, wasn't Carrie Lake uh, also like a Pied Piper? project for the democrats did they promote her to get in as uh yeah yeah they i did. think so right didn't and they? she might and, and now she might win right yeah. right this she's is a gonna good be speaker a i gotta admit very good speaker yeah very good speaker yeah from she's years that on broadcast television. voice yeah exactly yes. yeah oh yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i don't know i you know uh last time we did this uh, Katie, do you remember remember election night in 2020? Yeah. And it was like there was no way the math could work out any other way than Trump winning. By the time I went, I went to sleep. Right. And then, like hours later, it was it was a complete wipeout in the other direction. So I've I've given up drawing any conclusions about anything. Um, even at this hour, right? You know? uh, and, unless they're clearly calling uh, states for or or seats up. Oh, Democrats lost another seat. Which one? Uh, in the House somewhere. Well, they didn't they didn't lose it, but they they fell off the toss up category. Oh, okay. 
Which one? All right. Man, this is weird. Strange All right. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Strange I, don't know. I, I can't make any sense of it. Yeah. Should we make fun of uh, some of the clips we have? Yeah, yeah let's do yeah. it. We have some funny clips. Uh, well, so why don't we go to that 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 Dana Bash one? I thought it was so funny. It really encapsulates everything about this election to me. The numbers in these X's do not line up with what we were seeing in the. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I shouldn't make fun of that, and then I caught you doing it. Well, uh, Taibia, I was like, all right. <laughs> the numbers the in name? these X's do not line up with what we were seeing in the polling data going into this election about what people cared about and the order in which they ranked it. So we have had a lot of questions throughout this time about new voters, people that hadn't been in there before that were perhaps not getting captured by the polling. So maybe this is a sign that we're going to see a little bit more of that tonight than we expected. We obviously don't know yet. And you know what's missing from... By the way, this panel is full of like CNN plus rejects. Yeah. <laughs> right, so like... I didn't, didn't have anywhere to put them. Yeah, so like Casey, uh, I think that's her name, her show yeah. got canceled. Chris Wallace's show got, got canceled. I mean, oh, yeah. and then Jake Tapper, by the way, you know, we were so excited because Jake Tapper got a primetime show on CNN, but that just got canceled too. He was, a, I did? He was a yeah, he's done after like a few weeks. Uh, really? Jake, Jake is getting kicked back to the afternoons because his primetime show didn't work out. So, wow, that um, was fast. So it's a tough yeah. time for CNN right now. I mean, it's you know, this is this is hard times for them. It's hard well, times. That's like, that's like being a coach of the Nets or something. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, wait. Have any of those people who, who's on that stage? Have any of those people had a show for more than eight minutes? <laughs> well, Dana fills in for Jake, right? With State of the Union. Oh, well, I right. guess she won't be anymore, right? Because Jake's probably going to be back at State of the Union again. Yeah, and he's back in the afternoons. Yeah, Dana hasn't been canceled yet, but look, but let's listen to how upset she is that okay. her number, right. her top issue is not shared by voters. This oh, yeah. one, yeah. two, three, four, five, top five issues, democracy. Oh, yeah. It's not even in here. It's not to say that it's not an issue for people, but it doesn't not even the come issue. close. Well, not the I issue. Do think that Wait, let's start from the beginning. So how do we sit? Let's do the beginning. Okay, hold on. Is that the numbers in these exits do not line up with what we were seeing in the polling data going into this election about what people cared about and the order in which they ranked it. So we have had a lot of questions throughout this time about new voters, people that hadn't been in there before that were perhaps not getting captured by the polling. So maybe this is a sign that we're going to see a little bit more of that tonight than we expected. We obviously don't know yet. And you know what's missing from this one, two, three, four, five, top five issues? Democracy. Oh, yeah. It's not even in here. It's not to say that it's not an issue for people, but it doesn't not even the come issue. close. Well, not I the do issue. Think that oh, yeah. That thing we've been talking about nonstop for two years, nobody cares about it. Oh. Yeah. I know. It's just that, that little, like, you know, we told you to care about this, and it's right. not even your yeah, top five issues. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. You know? Why, why do we even do this job? I know. <laughs> Very passive-aggressive <laughs> school teacher vibe going on. Right? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like, I mean, it's like, it's an issue. It's I'm sure it's an issue. It's not top five. <laughs> It's not, 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 yeah, it's not top five. It's, it's not gonna. It's not not gonna get the numbers that I uh, that I need to get my contract yeah. renewed. But whatever. You know? uh, Is there more in that clip? Let's fit, let's watch the whole thing. No, that was it. That was That's it. it? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just so funny that like these uh, entitled, you know, highly paid cable news pundits just can't fathom that average people, average voters, don't share their narrative fixations about. January 6th and, you know, saving democracy. They care about, you know, putting food on the table and things like that, feeding their kids. Yeah. But they I mean, the, 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 uh, the Joy Reid thing about inflation is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah. So what did she say that, like, in, people talk about inf inflation is like a new thing that, like... That, yeah, it was, like, invented by the re Republicans in, in okay. after 2017 or something like that to scare people with. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I mean, it, it's only been like the central issue in yeah. economics dating back to the early 70s, but whatever. Uh, and not necessarily, by the way, against poor people. Like inflation can yeah. sometimes be a good thing for 
the lower classes because like it's an opportunity to i mean usually it's a bad thing but but uh you know once upon a time you know if you were a farmer and you borrowed money uh to to do to, to plant your crop and by the time you had to pay back the banks the money you know the value of the money had had, had uh had been inflated that was a good thing for you or if you bought something in the meantime there's some mobility that happens right but people with the but lower class people have been aware of inflation since like the mid 1800s as a central issue you know i mean i don't know you know where I, you know, I just realized where i first i can first remember hearing the term inflation and I don't know if you know that song by Grandmaster Flash, the message, like, don't push. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And there's a line in there. I, I just looked it up just to make sure that I had this right. And it goes, got a bum education, double digit inflation. inflation. That's right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Train to the job. There's a strike at the station. So that's from 1982. <laughs> That's that early. That song yeah. is from eighty two. Yeah, so no, that's, that, that's not a Republican talking point. Like, but like, the, no, uh, that, that was song. when they that was when they brought in um, what's his name, Paul Volcker, to to crush right. inflation. Remember that whole thing because there were like the the Carter years. There was the energy crisis. Inflation was going up, and the, the, they they brought in Volcker to crush inflation. That was like a thing. Like when we were when I was eight you know or 10 or whatever it was uh so yeah now it's an invented issue again joy reed i mean uh, look that's i mean the whole her whole story is amazing like she bla she gets caught blatantly lying about a hacker uh infiltrating oh God, her blog yeah. and making being her a homophobe making her homophobe and she keeps her job and so stuff like this will happen in that situation yeah that's no i mean Incredible media but she, story. But she she sells it though. She's got confidence. She does. She does. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like she doesn't yeah. flinch. Yeah. No, she, she definitely acts like she believes that a hacker hacked her blog and made her write homophobic stuff. For sure. For sure. Yeah. For sure. It's happened to the best of us. Yeah. I admire that. Yeah. That's pretty. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty good. Remember, she called Bernie Sanders the clarion voice of the Democratic Party. Did she, she did? really? really? But then she brought on a body language expert to. Uh, she, this yeah, the weirdy. That. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God! What, what was that word? She used the word turtle. The, 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 the turtle. Uh, oh yeah. Um, we gotta weirdy. look that up. That was from um, when she was talking about anti forever war. She was talking about Tulsi Gab. Wait, what did she say? He turtles. That's what they said about about Bernie. That he turtled. That's <laughs> what her body language expert said. <laughs> Yeah. Do we have any more clips, Wilson, or or uh, or is that it? Uh, we didn't. Um... That one's it. We got a. That's it. Okay. We do actually. I don't know if you guys knew about this. We do have a camera of just Steve Kornacki's butt, though. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> Kornacki butt I mean, cam. Yeah, the OnlyFans. I swear to God, MSNBC is going to start an OnlyFans for Steve Korn Like, but they're going to like <laughs> Steve. Look, revenues down. We're losing advertisers. We're not hitting it in the demo. You know, we're only reaching 20,000 people in the demo, which is like 25 to 54. We got to put you on OnlyFans. Oh, God. Oh. It looks oh, like Kathy Hopeful is the projected. Uh, who will speak oh up God. for this man? Who will speak up for Steve Karnacki's rights, his dignity? This is crazy. <laughs> Someone asked me to rate my last performance on Bill Maher. I was pretty good last time on Bill Maher. I had a weak performance the time before. So... Uh, uh, you were on with that um, with with that Democratic consultant, the, the pink right? lady. I forget what her name was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, was good. Very pink. You were great. Yeah. 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 Who was yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, Liz yeah. Smith. Oh yeah, um, Mayo uh, Mayo Pete yeah. woman. Yeah. 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 So look at that. Here's Herschel Walker's now at forty nine oh, seven. Look. Here's Brad wow. found this tweet. Here it is. Ready? Revising my tweet from today. The great clarion voice in the Democratic Party is Bernie Sanders, and he'll be ignored just like Dean. What year was that from? Twenty what? Two thousand ten. Yeah. That was a hacker. That was a hacker. Katie. Yeah, right. She didn't like that. Right. Was a hacker. Okay. But Don't. she said uh, Bernie's lying. This is the, the the body language. Yeah. yeah. Uh, experts saying that uh, Bernie's lying because his shoulders came up like a little kid getting caught. Adding that he was trying to quote hide in plain sight. Uh, he starts with quote well liars start with well. 
Uh, God, that was such a good claim, clip. Claiming that his, quote, weirdy posture is proof of his dishonesty. Uh, yeah. We should, we got, we, we should watch we that clip. It's so good because then she's wow. like, she's like, if I said to you, the Easter Bunny is real, what would you say? I would say, we've got to find that clip because it totally backfires. Like, Joy Ann Reed does not do the thing that the Ooh. expert wants her to do. What? They're calling it for Vance. This looks like okay. a weird yeah. game, video game. All right. Well, that's kind of big. Yeah. Vance, yeah, that's a. He's leading by a pretty big margin too. So wait, why why is that not reflected? I guess we need to deliver Tim Ryan a hillbilly eulogy. <laughs> pretty good, Katie. Pretty good. Hang on a minute. Wait a minute. Why is that not? Are the Democrats going to pick up a seat? So, oh, okay. So it's Pennsylvania. Well, Oz has narrowed the gap since we last checked oh in on the price. As What's Matt was saying, yeah, the gap is it's only uh, like one point oh, three percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and All you were right. saying that before that that Oz was was narrowing Fetterman's lead. And right. What about Kelly and Masters? I mean, Kelly's ahead now, but it's too early to call, I guess. Yeah. So there, like, the Look New York Times, Steele's, his hair comes out a lot in the back. Sorry, you can't. You see it? It's like wait. a shelf. Michael Steele's head, hair Michael in the Steele's back. Head? I didn't see it. All right, you'll see it next time he's in three quarter. He was talking a lot about blood before. Really? Yeah. What's he was using a lot of. Poof? Who? Pluff, ploof. Here, oh, can ploof? you see? Yeah, look at his little. He's like as. Oh yeah, he little, does have a shelf. A shelf, yeah. yeah. A hair shelf. Yeah. A Walker's up forty-nine seven. Is he gonna win? Oh wow, Hokel's doing really well against Elden. He's got to move the pile. Wow. Uh. All right, so. The New York Times is 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 playing some games with with the uh, Our hearts. their estimates. Oh, okay. Why? What are they doing? Well, they're claiming Nevada is leaning Democratic. I I just don't. I can't believe that. Do you believe that? Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Nevada election results. We have. No results in. So this is all based. This is based on their pot, their polling. But every poll I've seen has Laxalt up by like two to four points. So, so I think I think we might know. We might have Republicans having the the Senate by the end of the night. Wow. Even without Georgia. Wow. Wow. Ohio is a big deal. Right? Yeah. Because if you have Ohio and Pennsylvania cancel each other out, then all you need is Nevada. Right? Am I wrong? Am I missing something? No, I think you're right. And um, yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, but that's not exactly like a mandate. Mm -mm. Republicans have to feel kind of crap about this because, like, the yeah, world is sort nothing. of falling apart, and they they yeah. can capitalize on it. Yeah, yeah. and again, the red wave is not a tsunami. It's, it's Trump's fault. <laughs> it's going to be Trump's it fault. It yeah. is because if, if Oz and Walker lose, that you, I mean, these were Trump guys. Like, he personally handpicked these people, and or at least he picked Walker. I don't know about Oz. Certainly, he put his weight behind Oz, and if you know, if they lose because of them, then that's on Trump. And but, he's still going to announce for president next week. Yeah, he almost did it this week. He yeah. came very close. But so, okay, DeSantis won by nineteen, right, or twenty? What did they win by? Oh, let's see here. Uh... He run by a lot. Like, and Marco Rubio got reelected too. 
Right, by a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he... So the, the, the headline of this is going to be Trump. Trump was bad for the Republicans. And so now we're going to have Pied Piper thing again. Right. Where they're going to where they're going to try to elect Trump for the for the primary, right? Yep. And that's going to be part of our lives for another two years. Oh, Rand know. Paul. I mean, I'm not sure if this is big news, but Rand Paul w- was reelected over Charles Booker. Yeah, pretty comfortably too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mo- none of, none of those races were really the the only one that looks like a it's a little bit competitive is the Ron Johnson one uh, against Mandela Barnes. Right. Yeah. But he's, yeah. he's now pulling ahead in that. And the significance of that one is that it's going to be, if the, if the Republicans win that, then, then there's a judiciary committee switch. Right. So he takes over the judiciary committee from Durban, I think, which is going to mean, Probably investigations of FBI, CIA, uh, but who knows? Whatever. Who knows with these Republicans? You know, you never know. It's like there are they. There's been rumblings of them cutting aid for the proxy war in Ukraine, but I strongly doubt that. I oh, I don't believe that. that. Do you believe that? I don't know. Like JD Vance, who was like, you know, accused of. Um, because he said something about I don't really care what happens to Ukraine. I think he'll totally fall in line like everybody else. The the the, uh, the Republican who is running in my district, out of curiosity, I checked to see yeah. if if the Republican was maybe a little bit more anti-war than the Democrat in my district, um, and uh, basically, you know, Mikey Sherrill is my is my congresswoman. She's a former Navy helicopter pilot. She's been like over to Ukraine a bunch of times and she, she just can't, she's on the armed services committee, can't spend enough money on, um, uh, on weapons. Ooh, I know governor. Uh, but, but our, the Republican challengers, like she hasn't done shit for Ukraine. Like we, we, <laughs> we, we need to spend more and all this stuff. So there's no choice. That's like, it's, it's all, you know, all yeah. World War III stuff. Oh yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna. Uh, if you guys are right, I'm gonna check out. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Matt, it's great to see you. It was great yeah. to see you. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. Uh, have a good the rest of uh, election night. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna uh, wrap it up pretty I'm, soon. I'm depressed. So uh, why are you depressed that there's I don't nothing? Know, just, just generally, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe not even because of this. Just, just generally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, good to see you both. You that. too. Great to see yeah. you, Matt. Right. I, I hope your hangover you. is merciful tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be yeah. Fine. yeah. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye, Bye. Taibi. Take care, Matt. Good to see you. All right, this has Matt been Taibi. fun. Yeah, what were you we gonna say? Well, just great to see Matt and great, great to, to get his, Matt. his analysis. Yeah, uh, and that great race. Adidas outfit. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, are we wrapping? I think we're wrapping, right? Yeah. Oh, we got the body language uh, clip. You want to do that last? Okay, sure. sure. All right, let's go out on a good note. Let's watch this body language clip. Thanks. And he slouches forward anyway, Joy, but here he. T- okay, by the way, this is when, just so people know, this is when basically Elizabeth Warren <laughs> lied about Bernie Sanders, said that he said a woman couldn't be president, which no one really believes happened. And then Joanne Reed had this body language expert on to. Uh, analyze his body language okay see him he slouches forward anyway joy but here he turtles if you look at his eye level where he normally answers questions when he makes the denial his whole shoulders come up like a little kid getting caught his eye level is below his shoulders this is trying to hide in plain sight and many of us we don't know what to look for so if you look for this right out of the gate and the strongest denial is simply saying no and i think women in particular we want to believe human beings so we're like yeah i would i would say that he literally said well as a matter of fact i did and say it that's nine words unnecessary no did you vote for donald trump in the last election absolutely no <laughs> right so no did you dress up as an easter money and easter absolutely no right so it's no we say no absolutely is actually not the strongest denial you're you're playing with me here in the 
She's accusing no. Joy of being a liar. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's like, you're playing with me, obviously. She literally does the exact thing that she says that proves that Bernie's a liar. Ugh. She doesn't just say no. She says absolutely no. So she's a liar. Game, but at least you're getting the no in here. We're not hearing the no with Bernie. Also with Bernie, he has numerous hotspots. He says, well, mm -hmm. liars like to start with, well, he looks mm -hmm. away. He laughs. I think he might have been coached to laugh in this moment. A lot of politicians are coached to laugh in the difficult times. So we're focused on the laughter and, and it's supposed to send a message that this isn't serious. It is serious. If he said it, which I believe that he did, he would have been better to just own it. Uh, you know, Barack Obama wrote a book years ago, years ago, and he said what in the book? He tried cocaine and marijuana and he never touched the stuff again we never talked about it when he was president after that if bernie bernie should have said when he was asked about that he should have said i tried cocaine and marijuana and never touched it again anyway well we have wow. our final guests guys wow. we have our final guests we got one more guest are you guys ready i'm ready yeah none other than david sirota Hi, sorry david. i'm sorry that's okay i'm, I'm sorry sorry i'm wrong. Where are you? Let us uh, know. I am, I am outdoors at the uh, rooftop uh, of the Colorado Democratic Party. Down there, playing um, half reporter, half political spot. Nice. All right. Well, congratulations on both of those fronts as being a reporter and a political spouse. Yes. Um, what would you like to share with us for tonight? What are your takeaways, predictions? Oh, boy. Uh, look, I, it kind of looks like they didn't get the shellac, at least as bad as uh, they could have gotten the shellac. I was saying uh, to a friend recently that, um, you know, I think, it is, I think it's the correct math that in my lifetime, um, the only time a party that has had a president where they didn't get pretty badly shellac in an election, but the party in power, was in 1998. In 2002, I think those are the two times. I think there's not really another example of that, at least as that long. And I think um, if they end up not getting shellac, I think you know, if like that, if the Republicans kind of like barely win it, it really is like the Republicans really fucked it up. Like they really, really would have fucked it up. And I have to believe that part of it is that. They never put forward an argument about what they would do about inflation. Yeah. Right. Like right. they campaigned about inflation, but they never were like, yo, here's what we would actually do. Right. And I think so, like, that's a real missed opportunity uh, for them. Um, I also think it's a real missed opportunity for the Democrats to actually potentially have won some seats in the sense that they didn't really have an inflation message either. They didn't really name any villains. And um, right. so, it, so they kind of fought it. It looks like right now, I mean, who knows, but like, it certainly doesn't look like a wave either way. And I just kind of think like, could it be possible that, that both parties kind of fucked it up? <laughs> right? Like both part. like, I, I think that's kind of, where it seems like we're at. And I, and I also think that, you know, in some key races, I, you know, I spent the last week with in Pennsylvania with Josh Shapiro, uh, the guy who's running for, who's now named uh, the yeah. ejected winner of the gubernatorial race there. Well, like the Republicans ended up nominating somebody so extreme that it made the campaign that much easier for the Democrat. And look, Shapiro- but That's what the Democrats did, right? Yeah, and then that, Shapiro yeah. was criticized for kind of, you know, airing ads into the Republican primary to help the most extreme candidate. And look, I, I want to be very clear about that. You are really playing with fire when you do that. That is really some dangerous shit to do, to like try to boost kind of the most extreme candidates. Um, so if you do that, things can go really badly wrong. But I do think that after 2021, in a place like Pennsylvania, where in 2021, a neighboring state, a bluer state, uh, New Jersey, the polls were all wrong and Phil Murphy almost lost. Like, to play with fire like that, I think is incredibly dangerous. But I also think that, you know, like, there's always a Todd Aiken candidate, Todd Aiken, the 
candidates from who I didn't remember the year, but there's always one or two candidates who take it so far that they right. like, like there is a rock bottom. So who I says that women, today. when they get raped, uh, he was asked about exceptions for abortion exceptions in the case of rape, and he said that women, when they're legitimately raped, their body shuts it down. Right, like so they can't get pregnant. And I think when raped, Triana, yeah. in a different way, kind of became the radioactive Todd Aiken of of twenty. But I, but I think moving forward, here's here's the thing. Like at some point, here's my my basic fear. At some point, the Republicans are going to figure this out. And I think I'm out here in Colorado. Michael Bennett is a Democratic senator. He won. Um, but I think everybody out here is a little bit creeped out by the fact that even though Bennett won, that the Republican Party here for the first time figured out the primary produced a relatively normal nominee. I put that in quotes, normal. Like a normal person nominee. Like Joe O'Day... You know, you watch his commercials, you look at his profile. This is not Lauren Bobert. This is just a relatively normal Mitch McConnell. Obviously, Mitch McConnell. Should be. And I think the thing that, that everybody should be, if, if you don't want sort of super right wingers to, to win, is like the thing to worry about is if the Republican Party starts producing normal looking nominees, Glenn Youngkin, whoever, like, Right. There's only so much that the Democratic Party can rely on the Republicans producing freaks, right? I mean, there's all they're gonna figure it out. Like they are, and I think out here in Colorado, even though they lost, Colorado is a much bluer state than than it's been in the past. But I think, like, you know, the Republican part, the Democrats out here have been used to the Republicans producing, like, you know, Tom Tancredo or even more insane people. And I think, like, this is the first time the Republican primary has produced a relatively normal person. And I think at some point, they're going to figure out how to produce normal seeming people. And there's only so long you can get away with just hoping the part, the other party produces like, you know, sort of B-movie monsters. And, and I think, you know, whether the party can figure that out. Now, I want to say one other thing about this. I would argue that the reason that Michael Bennett did so well out here is in part that what are you doing out here? Oh, hang on, I'm on, a, I'm on a show. Good to see you. One, one sec. Uh, sorry, it's a friend of mine. Uh, uh, Bernie friend. Don't leave. Don't leave. Okay. Uh, uh, I would argue that the one reason that Michael Bennett did so well out here is because Michael Bennett finally figured out that he should campaign on economic issues. And Michael Bennett told me, it's interesting, there was a Huffington Post article about this. Oh, I talked to the reporter about it. I said, you know, Michael Bennett, a couple months ago, I saw him at a Democratic dinner. He told me that um, when he first got into the Senate, he didn't really understand that economic inequality was a big deal. 2010, came from the private sector. And he went on record with the Huffington Post and said that, uh, you know, we can go. And he had been airing ads and campaigning on his advocacy for the child tax credit, et cetera, et cetera. This is like a kind of moderate corporate de Democrat. Yeah. And he has campaigned on the economy and I think, you know, I don't want to, like, say Michael Bennett's like some great politician, but, but he's better than 80% of Democrats in the sense of better in the sense of at least acknowledging that the economy actually matters to people. Like, right. economic Domestic issues yeah. matter to people, you know, which is really kind of a sad state of affairs, but, like, this is some big revelation. But I right. guess the point is, is that... If Tim Ryan ends up being at least even mildly competitive, and ben, he ran almost exclusively on the economy, right? That like the Democrats still have to get right on economic issues to deal with the cultural war that's happening, like to, to be able to offer something other than right. the culture war. Because I don't think the culture war, even in the wake of Dobbs, they fought it to it, they might have fought it to a relative draw. Like ultimately, if the Republicans start nominating normal seeming people who, who come up with a coherent economic argument, the Democrats have to be able to have an economic argument. In their favor. And so far they don't. But I think like, you know, the Republicans took it very, 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 very far on cultural issues, you know, abortion in particular. And I think like, I don't think we can overread this election as like, oh, the Democrats have figured it out. It's like both parties haven't figured yeah. it out. 
and they, they ended up in a draw. And Trump picked, you know, two really awful candidates in key states, in Pennsylvania and Georgia. And, you know, totally. it, it doesn't, it looks like that's going to cost Republicans a lot, at least. At least Pennsylvania. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with Fetterman. I mean, that's that's the other thing. I, I mean, it's, it's hard to know what's going to happen in that race. I do think that's what's working for him, which is no one's actually talked about at all, is the fact that the Democrats had two strong candidates at the top of that ticket, Shapiro and Fetterman, and the Republican, like, Mastriano didn't really run a real campaign. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, and, the, you know, the RGA, the Republican Governors Association, didn't even really fund him. And so I think, like, there, there's got to be some level of boost of having two candidates at the top of the ticket who are strong doing a field operation and the Republicans only having one. And by the way, their other their one who they had, I'm not really sure was running much of a field campaign. It was just a kind of a television campaign. Right. So there's gotta be some built in help from that in that race. I mean that said like Herschel Walker potentially winning these right sort of I don't but like, I don't like what does that say about <laughs> anything right. like because like here's the thing like i just say this about that i haven't followed that race like county by county but like warnock seems like a like a maybe like pastor of martin luther king's yeah. church he's like a like a serious person comes off like as a really you know decent guy and, and like Herschel walker still even being in that race like i i don't like what is the takeaway for that like yeah. what where what what is that like that's upsetting like I mean, yeah, with the what things he mean? said. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. A great I question. don't know what that means. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it doesn't mean anything good. Like, I'm not even weighing in on the issues exactly. It's just like, what does that say? That, I don't know. Yeah. No, you know, Her- Herschel really Walker is a kid. Yeah. In Arizona. Like, the things, like the things Herschel yeah. Walker said are, are just unbelievable. And it's amazing that that race is competitive at all. And, and if I can make one one other point about North Carolina here, I mean, because I, I don't know, have they called that race yet? I don't think they have, but I think it's looking pretty like the Republicans are going to win. It's, it's the really, I mean, I, I've been obsessed with that race because it's been close and nobody's covered it. You know, here's a Republican, Ted Budd, who's been like, who is like a truly an avatar of corruption. Like we, we, we at the Lever did a bunch of uh, investigators to like very obviously on the financial services committee. I mean, we would have broke a bunch of stories about him pressuring regulators on behalf of um, Wall Street bankers to try to get around his state's predatory lending laws. This was nowhere to be found in that race at all. Like it was not, it was not even, there was no local media to cover it. There was not any ads. And it was kind of like, here's a Senate race that could decide control of Congress where you've got a, like a, like a sitting member of Congress who's got a record to be scrutinized and it it, it, it it like wasn't even it wasn't even part of the conversation. And I think beyond just that race, it's like what have these races become? Right? Like there's no local media to really cover it. The national media, I guess, will cover kind of you know like Herschel Walker insanity or but like the kind of kind of run of the mill normalized disgusting corruption like guy in congress helping his wall street donors get around his own state's predatory lending laws but can't break through as an electoral issue and i guess my point is if you're looking for what the democracy crisis is in america that's part of it it's not just like stealing elections it's like people go to dc they can do all these things candidates can you know now rely on the basic corruption and kind of economic theft that happens in politics to never be covered, never even be part of the discourse. That is a big part of the democracy crisis. Yeah. It's undecided still. North Carolina. Undecided. I mean, like, yeah. right, right. you got a guy who's like, you know, like one of the, you know, I mean, the banking industry said that's what it's his, what, he's one of the top three like the top three candidates that they want to win. It's just not part of the discussion. It's, right. it's not even part of the conversation. And it's partly because there's no local media. It's partly because the Democrats don't, you know, haven't pressed the issue. And I just use that as an example of like, what are these elections even about anymore? I mean, it, it kind of feels like these elections are about vibes. 
vibes. That's <laughs> funny. That's what Ross Barkin was saying at the er- when I had him on earlier. He was like, the vibes were Zeldin. The right, vibes it's, like were vibes. Zeldin. it's just like yeah. it's just like vibes, <laughs> yeah. you know, and yeah. like like that's the democracy crisis because like not to sound like overly idealistic but like elections are supposed to be about more than vibes they're, yeah. they're supposed to be about like something <laughs> yes. sorry to leave it on that depressing note no, no that's, that's okay. a great yeah. way to, that it's is a great thing we we just CNN played a we, we played a clip earlier uh david uh of uh, cnn where they were expressing their bewilderment that for voters democracy wasn't even in the top five issues and they couldn't believe it you know, they just couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, I go back to that quote from FDR, right? It's like, uh, I, I can't, it's in 1938, fascism's on the rise. And he says, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, other major countries discarded democracy, not because they didn't like liberty, not is because they saw a dysfunctional government. Uh, and in, in, in desperation, they decided to discard democracy in the name of getting something to eat. Like, right. when you watch the media and they can't believe democracy is not a top issue, but things like inflation in the economy are, it's like, have you ever gone out to sort of normal parts of the country where the first thing, the only thing that people are, that's on their mind is like, how do I get someone to eat? How do I survive? How do I get health care? Like, it, the, the, the discourse on TV doesn't relate to, and I'm, you know, I spent the last week in Western Pennsylvania with Josh Shapiro, like you go to those towns, like no one's, there's no, the, the, the top of mind issue is not, you know, this, this theory called democracy. And I'm obviously yeah. worried about, you know, democracy, but like the top of mind is like, how do I make ends meet? Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap it there. Uh, Cause uh, it's time for us to call it a night. So David, good, yeah. great I'm gonna to go see you. Playing, you I'm going to go keep, keep, keep playing a uh, political spouse. Thanks for having me on. Guys. Yeah. Thanks great so much. You, Sorry Thanks I was late. Me. Thanks for taking the no, time. All right. Thanks David. Take care. Have a great night. All right. Bye. All right, guys, this was great. Thank you all so much for coming. And uh, you know what to do. Like the stream, uh, subscribe to useful idiots.substack.com. Subscribe to patreon.com slash the Katie helper show. See me live in New York city next Tuesday at the people's forum. Uh, at 7 p.m., the show starts. Doors open at 6.30 with Miko Pellet, the great Israeli-American activist, uh, one-state solution uh, advocate. Uh, okay, that's all I have to say. Anything else? Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you so much, Matt Wilson. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks all the people who are super chatters. Um, thanks for liking both streams and also, um, thanks Phantom Miss Phantom for the clips. All right. Bye everyone. Okay, calm down.